Chapter 3 Agrarian Capitalism The Key to Britain's Rise to Power Quote I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not the madness of men. End quote. Sir Isaac Newton, after losing 20,000 pounds in the South Sea bubble. Footnote This ubiquitous quote varies in the last word between quote, men, quote, the people, and quote the crowds. During the first half of the 18th century, the British economy managed to weather two periods of agrarian depression to underwrite the cost of putting its own army in the field of war and still provide unprecedented subsidies to allies in wartime and to undergo regional transformations that created conditions favorable to industrialization in the north and west of England. The basis for this dynamism was the continued growth of the domestic market and regional specialization being driven by increasing rates of agricultural productivity and falling prices attributable to the continued expansion of agrarian capitalism. Between 1688 and 1815, Britain fought six major wars with France, a nation with three times its population, and would suffer only one defeat. The American War, which unlike the wars fought on the continent, was primarily a rebellion of colonists against the empire. England enjoyed several advantages, the protection of the Channel, a superior navy, and multiple allies and coalitions against France, within which Britain was the major player. Moreover, England's colonial trade was more extensive than any of her rivals. This trade, however, was in part a function of the expanding domestic market, which made the expansion of trade necessary and far more lucrative. Manufacturing in the early 18th century witnessed numerous potentious developments that signaled the approach, if not the arrival, of the Industrial Revolution. Darby's discovery of coke firing for the blast furnace in 1709 Newcomen's steam engine of 1717, and the construction of the old silk mill, to name but a few examples. Yet agrarian capitalism was already steering the economy in the direction of a broader capitalism by the time these key developments in manufacturing arrived. With output per head and overall agricultural productivity rising, exports of grain rising, food consumption and standards of living rising, Britain was outstripping all her rivals in the field of agriculture. To be sure, Britain had geological advantages over Europe. While trade in Europe was confronted with a more difficult terrain, a lower population density, rivers that were less readily navigable, and wider distances between river basins, England enjoyed an exceptional range of geologically varying environments. Quote, Nature had not been so kind as to Britain. End quote. Landis, as quoted in. Uh, never mind. <laughs> Landis. But the key to Britain's rise as a world power was its economy, which was on a new footing involving a unique market based or capitalist system of agriculture. John and Coleman. Views on the relationship between agriculture and manufacturing. There remains widespread skepticism over the significance of the role played by agriculture in helping to precipitate the Industrial Revolution. Before Brenner, most historians and historiographers saw the unique developments in English agriculture as playing an important but minor role as a causal factor in the Industrial Revolution. Agriculture forms one, quote, sector, end quote, among a dozen others in countless studies seeking the primary causal sector, while many reject the idea that such a, quote, smoking gun, end quote, exists. As we saw in both the foreword and the introduction, many resolve that the process of pristine industrialization is too complex to be reduced to a single sector. Fernand Burdell writes that 
agriculture, quote, rightly, end quote, tops the list of sectors in most studies of the causes of the Industrial Revolution. Quote, was agriculture an integral part of this mighty achievement, end quote? Burdell asks, quote, to ask this question is to be exposed to a thousand contradictory replies, end quote. Burdell. Flynn and Habakkuk say no. Barach and Jones say yes. For his part, Burdell can only pose some tantalizing questions. He notes that the English countryside had been integrated into the domestic economy, that English farms had managed to feed the urban population into the 19th century, and that by 1780 English agriculture was providing enough demand for about two to three hundred thousand tons of iron per year for the production of farm implements. Meanwhile, England imported large quantities of iron from Sweden and Russia. Burdell asks, quote, was this not because the English domestic iron industry had significant capacity to meet the increasing demand largely accounted for by agriculture? And does that not suggest that agriculture was on the move before the development of industry? End quote. <laughs> Burdell. Sorry, got blow my nose. It's fucking allergy season, baby. Um. Forgive me. I'll probably have to do that again, but forgive me anyway. Burdell asks, quote, Was this not because the domestic iron industry had insufficient capacity to meet the increasing demand largely accounted for by agriculture? And does that not suggest that agriculture was the ma the move was on the move before the development of industry? End quote. Burdell. For Burdell, even quote, even in quote, the apparently absurdly backward seventeenth century, end quote, everything quote, was really on the move. End quote. Burdell finds that the Industrial Revolution is linked to the development of inland trade within Britain, but in asking quote, why did it develop so early in England, end quote, Burdell can only pose the question. All those quotes were from Burdell. Clarkson argues that by 1700, the skeleton of the manorial structure may have survived, but it was beginning to take on new flesh, that of enterprise and profit. He finds that the, quote, causes of this metamorphosis are obscure, end quote. Yet regarding its consequences, he states unequivocally that, quote, the very considerable developments in agricultural techniques and organization in pre-industrial England and the resulting increase in agricultural output did not transform the economy before 1750. Instead, it prepared the way for the Industrial Revolution of the late 18th century by permitting the gradual release of factors of production into industry and commerce. By contributing to a modest rise in effective demand among wage earners and receivers of income by non-agricultural sources and by fostering the growth of a market economy. By 1750, the agrarian yoke on the economy had been eased. It was not removed until the 19th century, end quote. This seems something that quote was Clarkson. This seems something of a contradictory formula, for although Clarkson qualifies the allegedly non-transformative but multifold changes brought on by new agricultural techniques as, quote, modest and, quote, gradual, the claim that agriculture, quote, paved the way, end quote, for the Industrial Revolution seems a fairly strong statement in favor of causal linkage. Flynn also prefers to see the contribution of agriculture as, quote, modest, end quote. Despite the coincidence of agrarian enclosures with industrial changes for Flynn, quote, it must remain extremely doubtful whether the agricultural developments themselves would be sufficient to have played more than a modest part in stimulating an industrial revolution, end quote. For Berg, however, this kind of, quote, anti-agrarian prejudice, end quote, has contributed to, quote, an enormously mistaken view based on a rather insignificant place for agriculture in British industrialization, end quote. Berg.
Burke claims that the evidence is now clear that the innovations that brought about most of the key technical changes in agriculture, irrigation, drainage, crop rotations, and the use of root crops were developed in the 17th and early 18th centuries, contributing to a dramatic increase in England's agrarian surplus. This surplus sustained population growth and the expansion of cities, which in turn helped to expand domestic and international markets. Joan Thirsk seeks to shift the emphasis away from demography and argues that the type of farming community and the form of social organization condition the pattern of growth by in by excuse me in by employments by dash employments especially in pastoral or dairy regions both berg and thirsk tend to see the growth of cottage manufacturing as a development arising out of agrarian conditions and attributing to the development of industry but do not necessarily embrace the view that cottage manufacturing consists of a stage of quote proto-industrialization, end quote. Where English agriculture is concerned, theorists of proto-industrialization have not entirely overlooked England's uniqueness in constructing a theory that makes a claim for a pan-European path to industrialization. This is crucial because it demonstrates that even though the thrust of proto-industrialization theory has been to try and support the concept of a pan-European development, of cottage manufacturing as a precursor and progenitor of capitalist industrialization at the expense of considering other causal factors, these theorists were nonetheless compelled by the facts to consider England's uniqueness. Peter Krita, in particular, writes several passages that would mesh well with the theory of agrarian capitalism, for example, quote, England was not, excuse me, quote, England was most deeply affected by the development of the rural relations of production, the appropriation of social surplus from labor in the form of feudal rent was discarded, and the adoption of short-term modern leases changed the feudal rent into capitalist ground rent. Since the 16th century, English agriculture became commercialized, and relations of production were increasingly determined by the laws of the market." End quote. Peter Kredita. <laughs> Everything in the passage above concurs with what we discussed in the previous chapter, where the theory of proto-industrialization departs from the theory of agrarian capitalism is in its understanding of how all this came about. Quote, population growth, a deepening social division of labor, and the growing demand for wool generated by an expanding textile industry converged and destroyed the traditional agrarian structures, end quote. Here it seems we have the demographic model, the commercialization model, and proto-industrial theory all rolled into one. The text continues, quote, The collectivism which had hitherto determined the village economy was replaced by, agrari quote, agrarian individualism, end quote, Mark Bloch. This opened up the possibility to introduce modern agrarian methods like convertible hu husbandry, end quote. Creed to Medic and Schlumbaum. This is yet another striking example of assuming what needs to be explained. Demography, the extension of the division of labor and foreign trade spurred on by proto industry, are said to have, quote, destroyed, end quote, feudal relations. And then, voila, commercial agriculture spontaneously came into being. This assumption is clearly apparent when Creed to writes, quote, the steadily progressing disintegration of the peasant economy opened the path for an agrarian production that was entirely market-oriented, end quote. Creed to Medic and Schlumbaum. Creed to's main concern is with the rise of rural, rural manufacturing and how, quote, cottagers who lost their main source of income when the common land was partitioned and distributed among private owners were practically forced into rural industry, end quote. But which is cause and which is effect? Does English, quote, proto-industry, end quote, 
stimulate trade which then breaks down traditional agrarian structures? Or does the division of land through privatization and enclosures, which left a, quote, deep mark on the rural social system, end quote, a definite understatement, force dispossessed rural dwellers into cottage manufacturing? Krita is clear that England is the exceptional case when he writes, quote, Nowhere did the development of industrial commodity production in the countryside run so directly parallel to the reorganization of the rural relations of production according to the laws of the market as it did in England, end quote. But what explains England's peculiarity? Krita has no answer other than to appeal to the idea that, quote, England was ahead of her continental rivals, end quote. Footnote. The context of this quote should be made clear. Krita is discussing how England was able to overcome problems in the shortfall of supply for cottage manufacturing by replacing wood with coal. The full quote is, quote, Here, as in so many other cases, England was ahead of her continental rivals, end quote. The quote, other cases, end quote, for Krita to include the conversion to convertible husbandry, the quote, steadily progressing disintegration of the peasant economy, end quote, and advances in productivity, which will be discussed below. End footnote. And to the rule that says proto-industrialization develops under conditions of subsistence agriculture, Creed can only add the caveat that it could also develop in regions with commercial agriculture. Yet at the same time, Krita recognizes that what allowed England to avoid the income reductions in agriculture that befell the continent was the increasing productivity of English agriculture. Increasing productivity meant a steadily growing domestic market for goods produced in, quote, cottage industry, unquote. That market was stabilized by the intensification of agrarian production through increasing inputs of labor and capital which improved the soil and reduced dependence on the vagaries of nature, England was able to weather the 17th century crisis in agricultural prices because with median incomes rising as a result of the productivity of agriculture, the fall in prices did not mean an overall loss of purchasing power in the agrarian sector. Thus, the prerequisites for rural manufacturers were more favorable in England than on the continent. Critic sees the divergence as located in the, quote, relations of production, end quote. But what does Creed to mean by, quote, relations of production, end quote? Creed's analysis is sensitive to the pressures of trade, population, and productivity on different economic agents in English agriculture. But he says little about changes in the structure of property relations or the class character of social relations of production. It is unclear to, if Krita means that further research into these areas, not covered in his own study, holds the key to explaining England's distinctiveness. Ogilvy is clear about this when she calls for, quote, deeper investigation, end quote, of social institutions, since this, quote, may hold out the best perspective for explaining differences in economic development, certainly in early modern Europe and perhaps in pre-industrial societies more generally, end quote. Ogilvy is also clear that she, excuse me, when she states that, quote, there is no evidence that it was proto-industrialization which led to the development of commercial agriculture, rather than agricultural surpluses which led to the growth of both proto-industries and, crucially, towns and cities, end quote. While Mendel's originated the claim that, quote, proto-industrialization, end quote, breaks down the traditional framework of agrarian societies, something that was, quote, theoretically assumed rather than empirically demonstrated, and subsequent work on proto-industrialization has not confirmed it, end quote. Ogilvy, he nonetheless recognized Mendel's nonetheless recognized that the creation of a domestic market in agriculture 
in England was crucial to supporting the, quote, growing section of the population that was no longer entirely self-sufficient in food, end quote, Mendel's. Proto-industrialization theorists recognize the uniqueness of the English agrarian economy, but as they are wedded to the concept of cottage industry as, quote, proto-industry, end quote, and the stage prior to industrialization in a sequence of developments, they entirely miss the importance of enclosures, market dependence, and the effects of falling prices due to increased agrarian productivity and under conditions of agrarian capitalism. Both Mendel's and Creed to recognize that English agricultural development was distinctly, quote, advanced, end quote, and that agricultural productivity was the key to supporting a growing non-agricultural population. Yet they see, quote, proto-industry, end quote, as either the cause of or a key factor in the, quote, destruction, end quote, of traditional agrarian social relations. Not only is this understanding not confirmed by the evidence, writes Ogilvy, but in England, the Low Countries, Switzerland, and the Rhine, landholding patterns were already, quote, weak, end quote, long before the development of cottage manufacturing tied to international markets, namely, quote, proto-industry, end quote. Only if we abandoned entirely the notion that the expansion of rural manufacturing was responsible for the breakdown of feudal agrarian structures can we resolve this contradiction. This notion is itself based not upon the idea that there had to be a causal agent that released capitalism from the, quote, fetters, end quote, of the feudal structure. It is not based on a concern for how feudal social property relations were transformed into capitalist property relations, which would precisely require us to examine social relations of production and social institutions to understand both the dissolution of feudalism and the rise of capitalism. That is one of the goals of the present study. Where's my water? War, Debt, and the Land Tax England entered the 18th century between two wars with France. The most phenomenal aspect of the way in which war impacted upon the English state was its cost. In peacetime, a state expenditure of £2 million per annum was considered excessive. Combine the War of the Grand Alliance, 1688-97, and the War of Spanish Succession, 1702-13, cost British taxpayers £150 million. Of this sum, approximately one-third was raised through government borrowing, one-third from the land tax, with the final third coming mainly from customs and excise. There was considerable opposition to the growth of the excise, Unlike under the early Stuarts, this opposition had to do not with any renewed threat of absolutist or pro-Catholic tendencies on the part of the monarch, but rather with the concern that they would mean higher wages and lower profit margins. Quote, In other words, opposition to excise duties was motivated by a set of concerns which were distinctly capitalist in character. End quote. Moors. <laughs> The ultimate guarantee that the system would be maintained was the land tax. Being in possession of control of taxation, Parliament jealously regarded the land tax, as well as the appointment of the commissioners who supervised the local assessment, voting for it one year at a time. The land tax was assessed on the tenant, who then deducted the same amount from the rent paid to the landlord. Thus, in stark contrast to absolutist France, where taxation fell heaviest upon the peasantry, England's landowners were taxing themselves through Parliament. Since it was a tax on the ground rents paid increasingly by a growing number of capitalist tenant farmers exploiting rural, co rural wage labor, the actual proceeds were in fact rooted in this form of capitalist exploitation, specifically the tripartite structure of agrarian capitalism. <laughs> 
In both France and England, indirect taxes grew significantly during the early 18th century. In France, the expansion of indirect taxation was to fuel the seemingly limitless extension of noble offices in the absolute estate. In England, by contrast, these taxes were tolerated inasmuch as they went to pay for wars that forwarded English commercial expansion. A likely reason for the failure of Hartley's land bank scheme is the simple fact that country gentlemen were already paying for the war through the land tax, which typically rose during wartime. Lending more money to the crown might only encourage loser spend, excuse me, looser spending and result in an even higher land tax. Government borrowing for wartime expenditure was nothing new. What was new was the political infrastructure. Quote, the creditworthiness of the new regime, based as it was on a parliamentary title, was negligible without the clear understanding that the propertied classes would ultimately be prepared to foot the bill. End quote. As war dragged on and the debt mounted, the pretense that the debt could be repaid grew ever thinner. Anxieties mounted as well. Contemporaries believed that trade suffered disastrously due to war. The demands of the Navy drew ships and men from the shipping trade. Sailors and soldiers died, meaning the loss of, quote, intangible human qualities, end quote. Wilson. Domestic work such as the building trade faced a lack of supplies. To, quote, those who had a shrewd perception, end quote, however, the advantages of political stability generated by this, quote, machinery for channeling private wealth into public expenditure, end quote, were becoming clear. The ability of the English state to tap these vast new financial resources, based as it was, on the still emerging structure of agrarian capitalist relations in the economy, underpinned England's successes in the wars with France. Whereas England under the later Stuarts had earned the reputation on the continent as, quote, little more than a pensioner of France, end quote, Britain emerged from its victories at Blenheim, Ramier, Gibraltar, and Menorca as, quote, a major force in continental politics, a substantial power in the Mediterranean, and a worthy competitor for France overseas, end quote. Langford. War no doubt drew resources away from the economy, though contributing to it in other ways, such as shipbuilding, state demand for iron to make cannons, wool to make uniforms, and so on. The wars were also wasteful and directed with a significant level of incompetence. But it was through war that England beat out its rivals, in becoming the predominant transatlantic carrier in trade, holding a monopoly of trade and transport over a vast area. Quote, the rise of the British economy, end quote, writes Wilson, was based, quote, on the conscious and successful application of strength, just as the decline of the Dutch economy was based on the inability of a small and politically weak state to maintain its position against strong states, end quote. Wilson. Footnote. Wilson continues, quote, Without the wars, the entire course of world history might have been different. The Bourbons might have triumphed and survived, neither learning nor forgetting. New France might have gone on, authoritarian, bureaucratic, orthodox, neo-feudal. The United States might never have emerged, and Britain herself might have declined into the economic lethargy of Sweden or Holland, end quote. We can always speculate, be, a, we can always speculate about how things might have been, but let us note that Wilson is surely not accounting for England's economic advantage, its agrarian capitalism. End footnote. This is a potentially misleading statement. It is true that Britain could not have expanded its empire without the use of force. Other powers would have claimed these territories instead. And for any empire, expansion widened the sphere of trade. But what distinguished Britain was its ability to sustain levels of production to meet demand. By 1700, as much as 40% of England's economy had moved out of agrarian employment. Within agrarian Europe, only the commercially oriented economy of the Dutch Republic had seen a similar development. 
In non-capitalist countries, the economy was limited by the low level of agricultural productivity. As non-agrarian employment expanded, demand for food rose, driving up food prices, wages, and thus the price of manufactured goods. As prices rose, buying power was undermined, thus forcing the domestic economy to contract. But in England, constant improvement in agricultural productivity allowed the steady expansion of the manufacturing sector and the sustained expansion of the domestic market, allowing England to meet the challenge of expanding its international markets by steadily expanding production at home. Brenner. Furthermore, England was uniquely able to provide extraordinary subsidies in the hundreds of thousands of pounds to its allies during the War of the Grand Alliance, a trend that was to continue. Footnote. To get the full scope of England's military commitments over the years 1688 to 1697, it must first be considered that a force of some 48,600 soldiers was committed to suppressing the Irish Rebellion in support of James II in the wake of the Glorious Revolution, lasting until 1691. At the very same time, 1689 to 91, England paid for between 5,000 and 12,000 troops serving the, in the Low Countries and repaid a loan of 600,000 pounds that the Dutch Estates General had made to William for his expedition to England in 1688. During these years, England began paying annual subsidies of £20,000 for Prussian troops in Flanders, £95,000 to aid Savoy's campaign in Italy, and more still to aid Habsburg and Bavarian troops fending off a French assault. Subsidies picked up once the Irish campaign ended. By 1692-3, England supported an army of nearly 41,000 in Flanders, of whom over 12,000 were foreign mercenaries. Annual subsidies of £25,000 and £35,000 respectively to Saxony and hesse cassel supported more troops in Flanders, and the numbers increased. From 1694 until 1697, England supported an army of 48,000 English subjects, 20,500 foreign soldiers, added to which were Prussian, Saxon, and Hessian troops living from English subsidies. Jones, 1988. End of footnote. The ability of the landed class in control of Parliament to pay the tax when it rose to, a, to new heights during wartime attests not only to the success of the financial revolution in England, but also to the strength of the domestic economy and the growing domestic wealth based as it was upon agrarian capitalist methods of production that could be mobilized for war. As the rivalry with France played out over the course of the 18th century, agrarian capitalism would generate the economic might necessary for Britain to outdo France in the game of imperialism, even as it was laying the foundations for the first industrialization ever undertaken by any country. The Storm Before the Calm As England entered the 18th century, the political convulsions of the 17th century left a volatile legacy. The apparent unanimity of the landed classes after 1688 appeared threatened by the rift between liberal Whiggism and country Toryism. The schism turned on the legitimacy of the regime and Tory sympathies for the Stuarts. But beneath this was an increasing anxiety among country gentlemen, some of whom were hard-pressed to keep up with the pace of economic change over William's financial revolution and the increasing number of, quote, placemen, end quote, in charge of the nation's finances, making handsome fortunes during a period of agrarian hardship. The schism was also characterized by differences over the conduct of the war. <clears throat> 
with the Tories favoring peace and the Whigs holding out to press England's advantages. Excuse me, to press England's advantage. The real possibility of another restoration of the Stuart line gave this schism its profundity. In 16, excuse me, by 1697, France was made to sue for peace, and having managed to stave off financial collapse, England was able to gain an honorable draw with the Treaty of Ryswick. The English economy had not been seriously impaired by war expenditure, and the fiscal crisis of 1693-6 to by no means signaled an overall crisis in the economy, only a, quote, defective state of that instrument by which her material wealth was distributed, end quote. Macaulay. By 1700, England had broken its dependence on Europe and had reversed the terms of trade with Europe, now dependent... Excuse me. By 1700, England had broken its dependence on Europe and had reversed the terms of trade such that Europe now depended upon England as an entrepot. Between 1622 and 1700, imports of tobacco and sugar taken together had risen from 2% to 15%, while textiles had fallen from 41% to 26% of total imports. Between the 1660s and, the, and 1700, exports of foodstuffs rose from 3% to 11%, while textiles fell from 74% to 69% of total exports. Coleman Trade with the Baltic began to undergo a dramatic shift away from exporting woolens in exchange for grain toward a trade of re-exports, raw materials, and other exports for imports of timber, iron, hemp, and flax. While exports to Europe continued to grow, the overall percentage fell due to a rapid increase in colonial trade. Footnote. Specifically, the advance of the period was led by a surge of imports from New England, whale oil, lumber, furs, and provisions, the Carolinas, tobacco, rice, silk, indigo, the Caribbean, sugar, molasses, and wood, and Asia, spices, cotton goods. From Africa, gold dust, ivory, and the lucrative slave trade further enhanced Britain's colonial commerce. End footnote. Thus it was not only the volume of trade, but its shape that was changing. However, a severe slump in England's textile exports followed the peace at Ryswick. Cloth was at this time still very much England's primary export, and wool led the way. One cause for the slump was the decline of Holland's entrepot trade, whereby former customers were bypassing the Dutch middlemen and dealing directly with producers. Another cause was the rise in competition from Irish linens. In response, a prohibition was placed on all wool and manufacture in Ireland, and all Irish exports of wool had to pass through England, placing the entire Irish wool clip at the disposal of English manufacturers. This prohibition was consistent with the Navigation Acts, Primary materials within the empire were to be reserved for the benefit of domestic manufacturing in England. At the same time as England was ruining the Irish woolen trade, a policy devised to reverse the terms of trade with India began with a ban on all imports of silks and printed calicoes. By 1700, 14% of English imports were made up of textiles and spices from India. Indian cottons produced a, quote, near revolution in textile fashions, end quote. British customers seemingly could not get enough of the get enough of calicoes and muslins from India, quote, and sundry other exotically named cotton fabrics which started to flood into England, end quote, in the late seventeenth century. In Lancashire, where cotton had made its way into textile manufacturing in the form of fustians and other mixed cotton and linen products, the competition of Indian cotton posed a serious threat to domestic cloths. Coleman. The cotton cloth manufacturers lobbied for protective tariffs and got them, the first in a series of bans passed in 1701. 
These bans had the effect of stimulating the real the re-export trade. Footnote. In 1680, excuse me, in 1698, the interlopers had finally managed to gain a charter for a, quote, new, end quote, East India Company, creating a situation of two rival East India Companies that lasted until 1702 and lingered into their eventual merger in 1708. Its directorate included 19 merchants actively engaged in the East India trade, as it compared with only four actively trading among the directors of the, quote, old, end quote, company. The 1701 ban signified a victory for woolen manufacturers over the East India Company, in an ongoing trial of strength coming as it did during the, quote, Great Schism, end quote, between the two rival East India Companies. The ban was less than successful as consumers continued to prefer the Indian prince. This led in 1721 to a ban on the wearing of imported printed fabrics. The course of the legislation ran as follows. 1699, Irish exports of wool and woolen textiles to foreign and colonial markets banned. 1700, imports of silk and printed calicos banned or restricted. 1701, import, save for re-export, of printed calicos and other cottons prohibited. 1721, wearing or consumption of all imported pure cottons, cotton prints prohibited. 1736, printed fustians exempted from the 1721 Act. 30, yeah, okay. that's it. End of footnote. Experiments in imitating Indian cottons were also given stimulus. Though with limited success, most importantly, by sheltering and providing stimuli to the domestic cotton industry, quote, a new body of experience in cotton textile technology, end quote, was created. Footnote. This technology, quote, was to have its bigger and more famous consequences in the second half of the 18th century, end quote. Coleman. It was also under the protection of tariffs and silk that silk manufacturing would give rise to the first factory. In some instances, protective tariffs actually gave rise to whole new industries in Britain, or they made giants out of infants. The British paper industry initially produced only brown paper. After improving its technique, it managed to become the primary source of fine white paper and of printing paper for journals, which began proliferating rapidly after 1710. Wilson. Bans and restrictions on imports, however, were not the only means of protecting domestic production. They were also placed on exports, with the goal of reserving primary material for the benefit of the home industry. Wool was the primary instance of this. Not only was the export of raw wool banned, but so were textile machinery and emigration of artisans. Such protective policies were not in any way driven by the imperatives of capitalist industry for English manufacturers could not yet be seen as integrally capitalist, and capitalist production outside of England was still unknown. The goal was to create, quote, a protected home market, to restrict imports, and to encourage a positive balance of trade in manufactured products, end quote. Black. Since the 1670s, the system of government bounties on grain exports had been in place, and these enabled grain exporters to sell grain at below cost price abroad, leading to an expansion of English grain exports, sparking complaints from the Dutch and others over the flood of cheap English grain. The War of the Spanish Succession, 1701 to 14, was also, excuse me, also disrupted production on the continent, creating market space. For English textile exports. Thus England experienced an export boom during the 1700s based upon huge increases in grain and wool and textile exports to Holland, Germany, Russia, and Poland. Footnote. While England's competitors were crippled by war, 
They remained unable to compete or to uphold tariffs to keep English goods out of markets they previously controlled. For example, quote, when Spanish Flanders was won over into allied control in 1706, the English and Dutch set about dismantling the prohibitive tariffs created under French influence against their goods in 1701 and replaced it with a new tariff which gave an even more favorable position than that enjoyed under the earlier 1680 tariff." End quote. This both created an overall favorable balance of trade and underwrote England's ability to expand her military op excuse me, end of footnote. This boom created an overall favorable balance of trade and underwrote England's ability to expand her military operations and subsidies to foreign powers on a scale outstripping that of the previous war. In sixteen ninety seven, Louis the Fourteenth had recognized William's legitimacy as part of the Treaty of Weiswick. But when James died in 1701, Louis XIV now recognized his son, James Francis Edward Stuart, the, quote, old pretender, end quote, as the rightful heir to the English throne. The following year, William died, passing the crown to Anne, second daughter of James II. Anne had been the first heir apparent to attract opposition politicians to her apartment at Whitehall, a pattern that would be followed throughout the century. Footnote. Quote, prior to the reign of James II, Stuart monarchs cooperated closely with their heirs apparent. From the revolution, however, the heir to the throne was usually the nominal head of the opposition. The success of the revolution had legitimized opposition to personal, the personal wishes of the monarch, but not to the crown. As the distinction between monarch and crown remained uncertain, politicians who were not in royal favor sought the aid of the heir apparent to cloak their activities with some degree of respectability." End quote. Greg, 1980. End of footnote. Under the Act of Settlement of 1701, should Anne die without an heir, the crown would pass to Sophia, electress of Hanover. Out of the seventeen pregnancies, only one of Anne's children survived past the age of two. Jesus Christ. But when the young William Duke of Gloucester died only a few days past his eleventh birthday in, 1701, in 1700, Sophia became the heir apparent. The weakness of Sophia's claim could only strengthen that of the old pretender. Next to him, her genealogy was removed. Anne herself was, quote, an undoubted and undoubting daughter of the Church of England, end quote. In 1704, her 39th birthday was marked by the introduction of a bill in the Commons, later known as, quote, Queen Anne's Bounty, end quote, for the crown to surrender from 16,000 pounds to 17,000 pounds, of its traditional income to the church for the purpose of aiding the woefully inadequate, inadequate stipend for local clerics, excuse me, of local clerics. The Tories drew their strength from the, quote, twin pillars of loyalty to the House of Stuart and the Church of England, end quote. Greg. For her part, the Queen took the Tory cry of the, quote, church in danger, end quote, as a personal insult. I missed a footnote here. First footnote. The bounty was immediately popular and did much to counteract high Tory propaganda. As the Queen pointed out in her message to Parliament, she sought, quote, the advantage of the Church of England as a law, as a as by law established, for which nobody can have a more true and real concern than myself. <laughs> End footnote. Second footnote. 
This was the Tory strength in a country that was 90% Anglican. However, quote, the old Tory battle cry of, quote, peace and the church in danger, end quote, could not rival in popular appeal to the Whig slogan, in popular appeal, the Whig slogan of, quote, trade and the Protestant succession, end quote, to which Hanoverian Tories, no less than Whigs, could be expected to rally. Rent by internal dissent, the Tory ministry staggered on, while Bolingbroke indulged in fantasy by planning a wholly Jacobite administration and trying to gain control of the army and the strategic points in the kingdom, end quote, Owen. End of footnote. But the Queen nonetheless favored the Tories during her reign, despite committing herself to the Elizabethan principle of national unity, serving as the disinterested arbiter between opportunistic parties. By recognizing the old pretender's claim, Louis XIV had solidified English public opposition to his designs, and by resurrecting the Jacobite cause and the threat of a French-backed invasion of England, he had secured the Anglo-Dutch alliance to prevent Louis XIV from inheriting the Spanish throne. Footnote. The drift back to war had already begun by this point. While Louis XIV had reluctantly agreed to lay his claim to the Spanish throne aside in favor of his grandson, Philip, Duc d'Anjou, who became Philip V of Spain, the rest of Europe waited to see whether Philip would be his own man or a puppet of his grandfather. When Louis sent his troops to rebuild fortifications in the Spanish Netherlands in February 1701, the English and the Dutch began their preparations for a return to the battlefield to check French expansionism once again, and to prevent a Franco-Spanish behemoth from emerging. Louis had also cut off England and the Netherlands from trade with Spain. The fate of both the ne Spanish Netherlands as a trading partner, and Spain's American possessions as a potential export market, were of the utmost concern to Britain, as later events would bear out. End footnote. The War of the Spanish Succession that followed would not end during Anne's reign. The scope of the land war was bewildering, with simultaneous battles being fought in Spain, Italy, and the Spanish Netherlands. Initial success in 1705 and 1706 led Parliament to allot unprecedented sums of money to the war effort, quote, in the hope of final victory in 1707, end quote. Though 1707 brought a reversal of fortunes, in the same session, plans for union with Scotland proceeded arising out of security concerns for both countries. For England, concern lay in the very real threat that Scotland might reject the Hanoverian succession, and thereby also the revolution settlement, and recognize instead the old Stuart pretender as heir to the Scottish crown. For Scotland, Union might allow it to provide excuse me, for Scotland, Union might allow it to avoid being turned into a bloody battleground as a pawn in European politics. Scotland had economic reasons to support the Union, however. Scotland's chief export was linen and England was by far the largest market. Union would meet access to a free market and the end of paying duties on exports to England. Footnote. While England could easily obtain linen, linen from other sources, Scottish linen makers depended upon the English market. Quote, How much this influenced the final decision is impossible to assess. The merchants of Edinburgh certainly asserted in 1710 that, quote, the great inducement made use of to engage Scotland in this union was the prospect of improving and vending our linen by a direct exportation, end quote. End quote. Dury, 1979. End of footnote. Though bitterly opposed by the Tories, the Act of Union with Scotland was ratified on the 1st of May, 1707. Footnote. The Tories saw a threat to the Church of England in the recognition of Presbyterianism as the established Church of Scotland. 
The Tories also represented a long tradition of English snobbery, or worse, directed at the Scots. When James the Sixth of Scotland became James the First of England in 1603, he made attempts to unify the two nations. However, in his proposal to unify the laws of the two nations, but not their parliaments, Parliament smelled a rat. Debates at Westminster revealed a disdain for the Scots bordering on the hysterical, quote, quote, zoological metaphor, end quote, remarks S.G.E. Leith, quote, was strained to the limit to describe the ravening hordes of Scotsmen waiting for the chance to flood southwards, end quote, end quote. Smout quoting live. The two parliaments were merged, as were the two fiscal systems, creating the largest free trade area in Europe. That's it. End of footnote. The two parliaments were merged, as were the two fiscal systems, creating the largest free trade area in Europe. The loss of national independence generated strong anti-union sentiment, and Scotland became ripe for a Jacobite attempt. So the old pretender... Twenty years old James Francis Edward Stuart prepared a plan to invade in March 1707. Although he never set foot in British soil, the threat was enough to cause a panic on London's financial markets and to precipitate calls for new elections to Parliament. In the elections, the Whigs won a crushing victory. The winter of 1708 was one of the worst in memory. Famine conditions in France led Louis XIV to sue for peace. But with the Whigs back in power, insisting on a policy of, quote, no peace without Spain, end quote, the war would carry on for another four years. The cost of war was extraordinary. By 1710 to 11, Britain was, quote, paying for fully 171,000 officers and men, 58,000 subject, and 113,750 foreign to fight abroad in Europe, end quote. Junes. Britain was able not only to field an army composed mainly of hired foreign mercenaries, but also once again to provide subsidies to its allies. At the same time, transporting supplies not being an option, local purchase for provisioning the troops was necessary. Footnote. Although, quote, Marlborough was the leading military figure in the alliance, the war was very much a collective enterprise, and one where Britain's direct military contribution was relatively small. In 1702, the Empire was meant to put 82,000 men into the field, the Dutch 100,000 men, and the British 40,000. However, Britain only sent just over 13,000 to the continent, buying in foreign troops to make up the deficit. Even at its peak in 1709, only 28,000 Britons or Britons were serving under Marlborough. Subsidies mainly to Savoy and Portugal reached an absolute peak of 875,000 pounds in 1710. End quote. Hop it. Second footnote. England's forces under the Duke of Marlborough were not innocent of atrocities. Sorry, where am I? From October 1702 to May 1703, during a streak of stunning victories in a campaign to secure the eastern frontier of the Austrian Empire, Marlborough's army, quote, destroyed everything in its path in a vain attempt to force the elector, Max Emanuel, to change sides. Marlborough oversaw the futile and awful destruction of some 500 villages, end quote. Hop it. But the fact that England laid out huge sums to pay for local supply suggests that England committed fewer atrocities in relative terms when we consider that the contribution, a holdover from the Thirty Years' War, was still in use by other armies. 
quote, in Poland down to the defeat of the Saxons at Fraustad early in 1706, Russian, Swedish, Polish, and Saxon armies repeatedly moved to and fro, levying ruinous contribution as they went. In classic fashion, plague broke out between 1706 and 1713, compounded the miseries of war. End quote. Jones, 1988. End footnote. Thus, most of the spending on foreign supplies would not provide any backflow to aid the trade balance. Critics who felt that England should concentrate on her naval superiority were dubious at the cost of a, quote, double forward commitment, end quote. Footnote. The, quote, double forward commitment, end quote, refers to a policy whereby the army was deployed forward on a permanent basis and the navy most of the time. End footnote. As noted, the total bill of the two wars of succession came to 150 million pounds. In peacetime, military expenditure of 2 million pounds per annum was thought excessive. How was England once again able to sustain such enormous outlays for war? The new financial institutions that had sustained the first war once more proved indispensable. But in order to borrow, there had to be private wealth that could be lent, and this is where England held an advantage which stemmed from England's superiority in agricultural output. Quote, Over the century or so preceding the wars, that there had been significant economic developments, the most fundamental being the introduction of various forms of convertible husbandry, almost unique in Europe, with a resu resulting increase in agricultural output. This not only transformed England's subsistence position, but also made more wool available for her textile industries. On this basis, England was in a superior position to command the resources to meet the demands of a double forward commitment. End quote. As quoted in Gray, 1980. No, no. Oh, no, shit. Excuse me. Jones. The double forward commitment testified to the dynamic growth of wealth in England's unique domestic economy, which is being transformed by the forces of agrarian capitalism. Let me coffee really quick. Oh, it's a little too hot for a swig. That's a, a real sip. Oh, man. What a weakling I am. That was a weakling sip. Unprecedented violence marred the, election of s the elections of 1710. The Tories were able to successfully take advantage of the discontent with the Whigs over the Satchevarel affair to divide the public and guarantee an electoral victory. Once in power, the Tories took full advantage of the public mood against nonconformist passing new legislation against them. The Tories also moved swiftly into negotiations for peace. When the Queen fell ill in 1713, her imminent demise set off a crisis in the Tory party leadership. An out-and-out -out struggle for power ensued between the more moderate Oxford and the Jacobite-leaning leaning St. John newly titled Viscount Bolingbroke, who had unforgivably allowed himself to be seen publicly with the pretender during the peace negotiations. In April, Parliament passed legislation confirming the Hanoverian succession. It offered a reward for the pretender, quote, dead or alive, end quote, should he set foot on British soil. This was merely an attempt to cover up political divisions so deep that they provoked Charles de Iverville, the French envoy of in to England, to comment, quote, Affairs are moving in such a manner that civil war is becoming inevitable in England, end quote. As quoted in Grigg. In May, Electress Sophia died, leaving her son, Elector George Lewis, as heir to the British crown. 
George, quote, was a convinced supporter of the claims of the Habsburg Charles VI to the throne of Spain. He was also a soldier with a warm admiration for the Duke of Marlborough, end quote. Put, quote, so much out of patience by Hanoverian intrigues with the Whigs, end quote, Oxford himself made final appeals to the pretender to declare himself a Protestant in the early months of 1714. The pretender adamantly refused. Footnote. Both men had made such appeals to the pretender since 1710. The early winter negotiations of 1714 were kept secret from each other and from the queen. Where Bolingbroke's appeals to the pretender were aimed merely at expediency, Oxford was seeking a sincere and immediate conversion. Greg comments of James Francis Edward Stewart that his, quote, private refusal to dissimulate his religion was the fatal decision which determined the course of his future career. In this, he displayed his full share of Stuart arrogance and lack of remorse, end quote. End footnote. The timing of the Queen's death in July 1714 seemed to preempt the imminent, the imminent crisis that had been brewing. The accession of George I came off initially without incident. The arrival of the House of Hanover, which would last until the death of Victoria in 1701, heralded an extraordinary era of political stability and economic prosperity. The initial quietude, however, was broken when protests erupted in over 30 towns on the day of George I's coronation. Violence also marred the elections of that year in which the Whigs came to power, despite the Tories having a huge majority of some 240 seats. A Whig majority was necessary for the Hanoverian succession to succeed, and it may have reflected a new elite consensus, but it was far from reflecting overall popular sentiment. The outpouring of popular discontent with the rule of George and the Whigs was sufficient for the Whigs to pass the Riot Act, suspending habeas corpus and inciting further anger and frustration. Thinking there may be no place for them in the new regime, the Tories began to look to the pretender and excuse me, not end quote, footnote, spec, end of footnote. Taking both the government and the unprepared Tories by surprise, the embittered Earl of Mar was the first to raise his standard in Scotland on the 6th of September 1715, proclaiming James III true king of Great Britain. The campaign had very little chance of success, by the 22nd of October, the Scottish and English Risings combined forces, but still only totaled a tiny force of some, a tiny force of 1,400 men on foot and 600 men on horseback. Seeking support, they marched toward Lancashire, and the face trebled before, and the force trebled, before confronting government troops and surrendering unconditionally on the 13th of November. Retributions followed. With the Rising defeated, the Tories discredited and leaderless, the Whigs now set about strengthening their formidable position. Any Tory was now tainted with the suspicion of having harbored support, if not given it outright, for the Rising. Those who lost the most out of the, quote, 15, end quote, were the Tories, who went from having a huge majority in Parliament to losing majority party, excuse me, losing major party status, all in the span of a few years. Footnote, quote, how a party which commanded a natural majority of the political nation, which had enjoyed since which it had enjoyed since 1710, excuse me, let me restart. Quote, how a party which commanded a natural majority of the political nation, which had enjoyed since 1710 a position of unprecedented strength in the House of Commons, and whose members had engrossed by 1714 almost every important civil office in the kingdom, thereupon disappeared from the political map as a potent force for three-quarters of a century, is one of the strangest riddles in British political history, end quote. Holmes. End footnote. For Holmes, the Tories had virtually self-destructed, quote, by spurning the limited yet important favors which George the George the First was prepared to bestow on them, by bungling their election campaign in the winter of 1714 to 15, and so failing to capitalize on a natural majority in the constituencies, 
by withholding their support, but not their sympathy from the rebels of the 15. Quote, they virtually offered themselves up as the sacrifice, as a sacrifice to their enemies, end quote. Footnote. Above all, Holmes blames the destructive power struggle between Oxford and Bolingbroke for this failure, since it paralyzed the army. The extent of Tory support and a footnote. The extent of Tory support for the Jacobite cause is impossible to verify. Filing rights of the quote disgrace of their leaders and the pillorying of them, pillorying of them, all for the sins of a few. End quote. Adding that quote the Tories did penance for their years of tampering with lost causes. End quote. The Anglican bishops turning against them out of the quote abhorrence. Of rebellion, end quote. Filing. Given the astonishing speed with which the Tories collapsed, how justified were fears of civil war? With the deaths in the years of 1712 to 1716 of Anne, Sophia, Marlborough, and others, quote, who had served their political apprenticeships in the Restoration era, end quote, came the passing of a generation that had carried those fears forward. The outlook of a new generation weary of war was not haunted by memories of the civil wars. Anne's reign, writes Greg, quote, provide, excuse me, proved to be the great watershed between the violence of the 17th century and the stability and prosperity of the 18th century, end quote. In retrospect, the real threat of Jacobitism lay in the threat of a French invasion, with France's recognition of the Hanoverian succession at Utrecht and the subsequent failure of the, quote, 15, end quote. Britain's landed elites had much to lose and little to gain by allowing a dispute amongst them to carry on any longer. Stability and quote old corruption end quote. After the quote fifteen end quote and the bubble of seventeen twenty, Britain's landed classes enjoyed a period of period of peace, a decreased land tax and a stable political system characterized by the extensive use of patronage quote old corruption end quote under the guidance of Robert Walpole. In effect, this amounted to the full consolidation of the political regime of agrarian capitalism. The economy as a whole continued to flourish as paper money and country banks vastly expanded the supply of local credit. Continued growth and regional diversification within Britain's domestic market, combined with the continued expansion of trade, particularly colonial trade, created the conditions for the rise of domestic consumerism and the pre-emergence of a middle class. The rise of consumerism, combined with the increased tolerance and freedom of the press, facilitated the growth of literacy, political consciousness, and ultimately popular politics. Despite their growing numbers, urban professionals did not yet approach the status of a, quote, class with its own institutions, objectives, and self-confidence enough to challenge the managers of, quote, old corruption, end quote, as surveyors, attorneys, tutors, stewards, tradesmen, etc., they were contained within the limits of dependency. End quote. Thompson. Despite growing resentment at this state of dependency and the strong desire for independence, this imperial middle class required allies in order to check the rampant parasitism of the elite. They these they found in the disaffected Tory squires, the press, the elevation of the courts, increasingly to play the role of neutral arbiter of disputes and the, quote, ever resistance of the crowd, a crowd which stretched at times from small gentry and professional men to the poor, end quote, Thompson. There was, however, much room for ambiguity, for even as these forces challenged the control that elites exercised over their lives through various forms of paternalism, now entering a period of decline, they were also faced with increasingly unregulated market forces that were being developed amidst the decline of such paternalistic forms of control.
the opening of some 60 years of Whig hegemony, end quote, excuse me, the opening, I don't know why I said end quote, there's a footnote there. The opening of some 60 years of Whig hegemony was not, however, without its fireworks. Footnote. Colley challenges the notion that the stability of Georgian England rested on the proscription and ultimate dissolution of the old Tory party. Specifically, she challenges Habakkuk's postulation adopted by Plum, namely that the engrossment of estates between 1714 and 1750 came at the expense of Tory estates and thus explained the party's decline. Quote, it was so convenient to assume that this decline in small landowners was the economic counterpart to the political decline of the Tory party, that the increasing rigidity in the 18th century land market, which Habakkuk had postulated, was the necessary libretto to the operatic extravaganza which was Whig oligarchy and Walpolean success. It was this combination of supposed economic obs obsolescence and supposed political impotence which has made the proscribed Tory party so unattractive to historians, end quote. Writing half a century earlier, Filing also finds that between 1714 and 14, I mean, se between 1714 and 1747, quote, all this time the fragment called Tories were not extinct, end quote. End footnote. Doubt was cast on Whig integrity when they passed the Septennial Bill in September 1716, fixing parliamentary elections to occur every seven years instead of three. Protests erupted when the Duke of Somerset introduced the Peerage Bill in 1719, seeking to consolidate the number and thus the power and privilege of the peerage at the expense of royal power. It was prudently withdrawn. These events were overshadowed by a diplomatic revolution when Britain entered into an alliance with its longtime rival, France. Meanwhile, a, quote, Swedish plot, end quote, to supply a force of 10,000 men for another Jacobite rising was exposed. Footnote. George I was generally preoccupied with his native Hanover, where he felt far more welcome than in Britain. Peace with France meant that he could concentrate on Hanover's interest in the Baltic, where he had drawn Britain's navy into action in the Baltic on the side of the alliance against Sweden, to which Hanover was a party in the Great Northern War of 1700 to 1720. End footnote. In June 1718, the Royal Navy defeated the Spanish fleet that had invaded Sicily in a short, one-sided affair between two nations who were not yet at war. In July, Britain entered into a quadruple alliance with Austria, France, and Holland against Spain, and its bid to reclaim Italian possessions given up at Utrecht. Threatened with more losses, Spain quickly made peace in January 1720 that same year the adventurer... The adventurous Charles the the twelfth, excuse me, Charles the twelfth of Sweden died in an apparent accident, and the Great Northern War of seventeen hundred to twenty quickly came to an end. From the first time in generations, Europe was faced with the extraordinary prospect of lasting peace. It was at this precise moment that Britain, France, and their trading partners were engulfed in the frenzy of speculative financial bubbles. In 1708, a city bank known as the Sword Blade Company had become involved in a legal dispute with the Bank of England. Its aim was to challenge the bank's hegemony, but when its own mortgage scheme went sour, it blamed the bank. Footnote. In turn, Spain took up support for the Jacobite cause, sending an invasion force in early 1719, which reminiscent of the Armadas was turned back by inclement weather. A second and smaller force of 300 Spanish soldiers reached Scotland and joined at the 1,000 clansmen before being quickly defeated. End footnote. 
One of the causes of the Tory victory in 1710 was the growing fear about the national debt. In 1711, the Tories announced a public lottery designed to help pay it off. The Sword Blade Company outmaneuvered the bank in fulfilling subscriptions for a public lottery scheme by selling all tickets in four days. Whereupon Robert Harley, whose land bank scheme of the 1690s had failed miserably, announced to Parliament on the 7th of March that the government's totally government's total unsecured debt now came to nine million. The next day, on the 8th of March, he was stabbed, and John Blunt, secretary of the Sword Blade Company, took charge of the treasury. Blunt immediately announced a second lottery. Harley returned to Parliament in April. On the 2nd of May, he announced his scheme to convert the entire nine million pound, the nine, the entire nine million pounds, into shares of capital for the South Sea Company. In return, the government agreed to pay interest and granted trading privileges in the Spanish Main, privileges later as secured when Britain gained trading rights in Spanish America under the Asiento. The, uh, the announcement was greeted with euphoria. Harley was made Earl of Ex Oxford. But the slave trade with Spanish America that was supposed to be the real business of the company was not turning a profit, and when war with Spain broke out in 1718, the company's property, valued, perhaps overvalued, at 300000 was seized, leaving the company exposed as a naked finance corporation. Meanwhile, in France, a Scotsman by the name of John Law was entrusted with France's entire national debt, valued at £130 million. Pounds which he converted into shares of his company of the Indies. The masters of the South Sea Company were challenged to match Law's success. They even sought to amalgamate the bank and the East India Company into their South Sea enterprise. Their objective, however, quote, took no account of the contrast between English and French economies. The French economy was stagnant and needed a stimulus which the already overheated British economy did not require. They never seemed to have foreseen that a mountain of credit unsupported by yield would inevitably collapse. By 1720, the total unsecured national debt stood at 31 million pounds. Oh shit, footnote. Note that here we have yet another author reflecting upon the exceptional dynamism of Britain's agrarian capitalist economy. In quote, quote, in modern values, end quote, writes Carswell, the 130 million pounds in converted French debt would it be about two billion pounds so that the company of the Indies even today is still one of the largest enterprises that has ever existed end quote By 1720, the total support unsecured national debt stood at 31 million pounds, and the South Sea Company outbid the bank for the next round of conversion with an offer of 7.5 million pounds. South Sea Stock Sword Footnote Within an hour of the book's opening on the 14th of April, a million shares had already been sold including a purchase worth £100,000 by the king himself. By now, fortunes were being made and lost. The greatest fortune was made by Thomas Guy, whose total reward for stock sold was £234,000. The hospital built from these funds was, quote, the best memorial the bubble left behind, end quote. Sir Isaac Newton withdrew his 7,000 pounds of South Sea stock on the 20th of April, having made a 100% profit on his investment. End footnote. Like the lottery, subscriptions sold as soon as they were on the market, enabling the directors to realize their profits even before the debt had been converted. In May, rampant inflation burst the bubble of Law's scheme in France. The currency collapsed and a drastic restructuring of French state finances was ordered. 
This only bolstered the value of the South, of South Sea stock, allowing it to dominate European markets. The company was now offering sweet deals for cash. For example, the company would announce that it would advance 300 pounds worth of shares for every 100 pounds in currency deposited. Under the French cash bubble, the South Sea bubble was a credit bubble. Excuse me, unlike the French cash bubble, the South Sea bubble was a credit bubble. Short of cash, Blunt would prepare each new subscription to mop up existing cash with more credit-based shares. Between February and July, the value of South Sea stock rose from 175 pounds to 1,000 pounds. In September, the bubble burst. By the end of that month, it had fallen back to 180 pounds. The company had no alternative but to turn, it, turn to its arch rival, the bank, for assistance. The damage was widespread. Urban workmen in London, such as builders, suffered mightily at the loss of trade, being forced to halt work on half-finished ships and houses. The, quote, experts had lost credibility. A wave of public scrutiny and moral judgments ensued with pamphleteers and journalists demanding answers and reprisals, quote, let us pursue to disgrace, destruction, and even death, end quote, end quote, cried one journal, quote, those who brought this ruin upon us, end quote. Robert Walpole, who had withdrawn his shares from the bubble early, and who had resigned as Paymaster General in 1717, now became Chancellor of the Exchequer and took charge of the recovery plan, under which the bank and the East India Company absorbed nearly half of the South Sea Company's 38 million pounds in paper capital. Money subscribers lost, on average, 50% of their investment. Holders of annuities lost between one and two-thirds. Despite all this, most were grateful for this settlement because without it, subscribers stood to lose the full amount of their subscriptions and annuitants, all but a fraction of their incomes. At the same time, however, Walpole's tasks involved, quote, screening, end quote, those in high places from charges of corruption, whilst satiating those crying for revenge. For he became known popularly as the, quote, screen master general, end quote. It was only the beginning of a system of patronage which would keep Walpole in power for over two decades. Walpole's system of justice had a decided class basis, excuse me, decided class bias. Footnote. Robert Walpole was one of the few and one of the last statements, statesmen, to make a, statesmen to make a fortune as a politician. In the 1720s and 1730s, Houghton Hall was transformed from a modest country house into a small palace. When he died in 1745, he left debts of 50,000 pounds on a mortgaged estate. His assets outweighed his debts, however, and in this respect his case may have been a typical one. Second footnote. To give some examples, despite damning evidence against him, Charles Stanhope escaped censure in large part thanks to Walpole's efforts to manipulate the vote in his favor. In March 1720, Stanhope was credited with, quote, 500, excuse me, 50,000 pounds of fictitious South Sea stock at the then market price of 250 pounds, which he, quote, sold, end quote, three months later at a price of 750 pounds. He thereby netted an extraordinary profit of 250,000 pounds, which was paid to him via a nominee account at the Sword Blade Bank, end quote. A clumsy cover-up ensued in which his name in the SSC's cash book, the South Sea Company's cash book, was altered to read as, quote, Stan Gap, or Stan Gape, end quote. Apparently, no effort was made to pursue the matter any further. Even John Ileby, Ileby, who served as the scapegoat for the whole affair, being expelled from the house and sent to the tower with all his assets frozen, 
would later be reprieved and allowed to spend the rest of his life practicing landscape gardening on his studly manor in Yorkshire, having retained 165,000 pounds out of 210,000 pounds in assets, thanks again largely to the intervention of Walpole, whose sympathies and standards of justice were decidedly on the side of those with money and influence. And a footnote. Walpole was duly rewarded with the House of First Lord of the Treasury in April 1721. His subsequent leadership or control through patronage of the Commons would later earn him recognition as Britain's first Prime Minister. Whilst the bubble resulted in many losses, the economy as a whole continued to flourish. The introduction of paper money in the countryside gave a boost to the agricultural revolution and brought a permanent improvement in the accessibility of rural credit. The first country bank had been set by James Wood of Gloucester in 1716, the first in a wave of country banks that would peak in a number around 1800 and nearly vanish by 1900. By the mid-1720s, the revolution in public finance was effectively complete, and it had an enduring effect on the finance of business that was sustained right through the period of the Industrial Revolution. By 1750, the buying and selling of government stock had been reduced to a routine. London, while rivaled in trade by the rise of the western ports, remained steadfastly the financial center of the country and increasingly of Europe. Footnote. Berg rejects the notion that the financial revolution and the industrial revolution had little to do with one another, noting that an increasing number of connections between financial innovations and industrial developments are were being uncovered at the level of the firm. Quote, it is too early to assign specific authorship to a story that is still being written and revised, but it is certainly high time to devise an analytical framework within which the various threads of the tale can be examined and pieced together, end quote. Neil is far less cautious about the matter, quote, It is very interesting that the regression of coefficients on the console yields are so similar for the two time periods, whose economic and financial characteristics are so different, as indicated by Marx's changes in the coefficients on laggard bankrupt, lagged bankruptcies and lagged exports, end quote. This suggests that the revolution in public finance, completed in England by 1725, had an enduring effect on the finance of business that was sustained right through the period of the Industrial Revolution, whenever it began. The web of credit among merchants, manufacturers, and bankers, however, had grown in terms of its radius, density, and strength. By the end of our period, marked by the Banking Act of 1844, it extended into all the trading regions of the world as well as into every niche of the domestic economy. From 1723, when the preeminence of the Bank of England as the premier financial institution in England was assured and the state had developed the perpetual annuity as its primary form of long-term debt, this web of credit was anchored securely in the city of London. Without this anchor, it is very doubtful whether the British economy could have made the structural changes in techniques, products, and markets that characterized its transformation from 1760 to 1850. End footnote. With the recent experience of the bubble and panic at the outbreak of plague in southern France, few would have foreseen the stability that lay ahead. The Tories returned only 170 members to Parliament in 1722. The Whigs prepared for another seven years of hegemony, further secured by the exposure of the, quote, Atterbury plot, end quote, later that year. Footnote. Atterbury, High Bishop of Rochester and a well-known Tory, was banished for allegedly conspiring to organize a Jacobite rising. The pretender's presence in Spain was to set sail on October 1722 did cause a, ma a minor panic. The quote, Atterbury plot, end quote. Oh, it's a quote within a quote. Quote, quote, 
The quote, quote, Atterbury plot, end quote, demonstrated with near complete finality the impotency of the Jacobite cause. On the 18th of June, 1723, Atterbury sailed away, and with him went many of the last hopes of the High Church and the Tories. Walpole assiduously cultivated the public perception that both were virtually synonymous with Jacobitism, end quote. It did not help matters for the Tories that Bolingbroke, having obtained a royal pardon by way of a bribe, returned to England in the same month, his presence a reminder of the Tories' agonizing relationship with the pretender. As the Prime Minister himself referred to it, the, quote, firm of Townsend and Walpole, end quote, was now solidly established. End footnote. While the buoyancy of economic life in London... After 1688, did I say end of footnote? I don't know. The, the footnote's over. While the buoyancy of economic life in London after 1688 was shattered by the bubble, what came after was a, quote, age of cautious conservatism, hardening social distinctions, ever more clearly formalized patronage and hostility to change, end quote. Carswell. Population growth, political life, and to a large extent even the life of the country squire would remain stagnant for a generation. The Bubble Act, which supporters of the South Sea Company had passed to restrict the joint stock ventures of their competitors, remained in effect and had a dampening influence on the stock market. In Parliament, the opposition viewed Walpole's system as a, quote, gigantic machinery of corruption which threatened to undermine the Constitution and to destroy the very fabric of society, end quote. This perception, oh, that's, the quote was spec. This perception seemed to be justified in light of numerous parliamentary investigations which turned up extensive corruption in high places. Footnote, quote, the Lord Chancellor was found guilty in 1725 of embezzlement and corruption for organizing the sale of judicial offices and fined 30,000 pounds. In 1727, a government supporter was expelled from the Commons after having been detected in a fraud concerning estates forfeited from former South Sea Company directors sold to the trustees of the Darwent Water Estates at artificially low prices. In 1732, the Charitable Response Corporation, which was supposed to use its capital to lend small sums of money to the poor, was discovered to have employed it for the financial benefit of its projectors. Next year, another scandal was exposed involving the York Building Company, yet all those supporters of Walpole were involved in all these cases. He emerged relatively unscathed. A generation which could stomach the South Sea bubble could swallow the lesser scandals with little effect. Walpole himself was quite cynical about the allegation of corruption made by the opposition. As Walpole put it, quote, I am no saint, no Spartan, no reformer, end quote, end quote. That's from Spec. No, where am I? And a footnote. While the Tories were a spent force politically, Tory wits such as Pope, Gay, Swift, with his Gulliver's Travels, published in 1726, were celebrated for their commentary on the moral poverty of the contemporary world. Footnote. Thompson opposes his critique to that of those, quote, historians who have become habituated to seeing this age in terms of the apologetics of its principal actors, end quote with the disclaimer that, quote, the alternative view which I offer should come with no sense of surprise. It is, after all, the criticism of high politics offered, quote, by Swift, Pope, Johnson, Mandeville, and others. Satire was a weapon that literary critics could wield in a time when no effective class or political force was in a position to challenge the Whigs and their system of old corruption. End of footnote. Their literary attacks on the regime helped to spur debate and coffeehouse gossip about the voting oligarchy among artisans, shopkeepers, merchants, and scornful dissenters. If, quote, old corruption, end quote, was secure for now, a new political consciousness skeptical of oligarchy was coming into being. 
Meanwhile, the exposure of massive public corruption was matched by the growth of private corruption in the form of a, quote, flourishing economy of crime, end quote, and the corresponding elaboration of the, quote, bloody code, end quote. Footnote. The success of the master thief, Jonathan Wilde, whose racket consisted mainly of restoring goods stolen by his minions to their original owners for a profit, of course, depended largely upon the collaboration of corrupt JPs and their officers in the city. I guess I think JPs is justices of the peace. The prisons were equally open to corruption. End of footnote. The Bloody Code was part and partial of the consolidation of power by the new Hanoverian regime. Its development has been described as, quote, an organic process of adaptation by a society concerned to protect new forms of property and to restrict the benefits of a huge increase in wealth, end quote. Several major pieces of legislation were foundational to its development. The Riot Act of 1715 was specifically directed at violent crowds of Jacobites and their detractors burning effigies of the pretender or attacking Scotch and Irish Catholics. But by fixing the labels of, quote, mob, end quote, onto the crowd and, quote, riot, end quote, onto a protest, popular forms of direct action now became tainted with the suspicion or the general assumption that the intent of the participants was, rare, was criminal rather than communal. This blow did not immediately undermine the legitimacy of forms of popular protest, however. Such legitimacy declined only slowly over the course of the century. Before 1787, 1787-1818. Such legitimacy declined only slowly over the course of the century, before 1718, the most common punishments for felonies were whipping and branding, but the Transportation Act gave magistrates the option of transporting felons to America, thereby reducing the, mem the numbers of those to be hanged and reducing even further those who had for want of an alternative to be freed back into the community. Transportation became by far the most common punishment meted out by the end of the century. Most important was an act which itself stemmed from a localized conflict between wealthy and closing landowners consolidating their property estates and commoners reacting to the loss of access to rights of commons. Responding to these disturbances at Enfield Chase, Walpole himself assumed the rangership and swiftly curtailed the customary rights of the commoners. Footnote. The act was specifically directed at, quote, blacking, end quote, or deer poaching in the forest in the south of England. The, quote, blacks, end quote, so named because they blackened their faces for purposes of anonymity, were led by the mythical, quote, King John, end quote, and enjoyed considerable local sympathy and support. They opposed the granting of licenses for hunting all game aside from deer in the forest and for felling of timber. For this they held violated their customary rights to cut timber on their own farms, to graze their animals, and to haul clay, gravel, and chalk, and cut furs. Or furses. F-U-R-Z-E-S. They retaliated by poaching deer, which were seen as a symbol of the authority of local officials, and their newfangled deer parks. The conflict was heightened by the acute shortage of timber. With the enclosing of the forest, blacking accelerated, and the authorities were anxious to proscribe customary access to timber. End of footnote. Then, in an extreme act of legislative overkill, Parliament enacted a piece of legislation that gave local officials unprecedented legal power to punish offenders against property. Excuse me. Punish unprecedented legal power to punish offenders against property in the name of the maintenance of order. 
Passed in 1723, the same year as the Workhouse Test Act, the Waltham Black Act, quote, proved an overarching capital statute covering almost every conceivable criminal activity, end quote. McLean. The Black Act was, quote, neither necessary nor especially effective in dealing with the particular, quote, emergency, end quote, which served as its executive, end quote. This was so in part because the legislation, while empowering local gentry and loyal citizens of the hundreds to enforce the act, did not provide the necessary funding they would have required to do so. But what the act did was to, was provide the regime with a, quote, versatile armory of death apt to be to the repression of many forms of social disturbance, end quote, as well as a, quote, model for subsequent terrorist legislation against disaffected Highlanders, Irish agrarian rebel, rebels, and English smugglers, end quote. Thompson. It became a capital offense under the Black Act to steal a deer, even a fawn, to fire a gun inside a dwelling place even if no one was hurt, or to commit arson. Other legislation confirmed and supported the bloody code, such as the Vagrancy Acts of 1744, which allowed for the whipping or imprisonment of, quote, beggars, gamblers, strolling actors, gypsies, quote, and all those who refused to work for the usual and common wages, end quote, end quote. Footnote. Quote, Edward Elliot, aged only 17, went to the gallows because he had strayed from his fellows during the raid on Alice Holt, trying to catch alive a young fawn as a present for his girlfriend, end quote. End of footnote. The Black Act thus served as a precedent for the expansion of capital punishments in the 18th century. Quote, blacking, end quote, or dressing in disguise by poachers illegally hunting deer in the forest of Hampshire and Berkshire caused an enormous affront to respectable society. End footnote. The act outlasted Walpole, being renewed five times after its passing and then being made perpetual in 1780, excuse me, in 1758. To many, Walpole was the embodiment of the corruption of his time. But aside from dispensing patronage, Walpole did have other skills. Walpole's meticulous attention to the proceedings of the commons on the one hand and his pursuit of pragmatic policies that would be attractive to a broad spectrum of the political nation on the other were key to his success. Another key was his ability to marshal a phalanx of placement in the, com in the commons. The creation of a court party in the commons dated from the reign of Charles II, and corruption was widespread under the reign of Anne, adding to the grievances behind the instability of her reign. When George II succeeded George I in 1727, like his father, he chose to prescribe the Tories. The paradoxically, this paradoxically brought greater stability to the government. Court Tories were more determinedly courtiers than they were Tories and the prospect of permanent exclusion from place and profit was more than many could bear." End quote. In 1727, some minor skirmishes with Spain, now allied with Austria against Britain, France, and Prussia, provoked fears of a return to war. But only the threat of war loomed. When George II took the throne that year, he would have preferred to promote a member from the opposition, but he quickly realized that there was none other than Walpole that he could look to for a stable, continuous government under a parliament, now very much operating in a routinized manner. In 1730, Walpole negotiated the Treaty of Seville behind the backs of Townsend, his partner who until now had handled foreign affairs. The infuriated Townsend resigned and was succeeded by the Duke of Newcastle. When the War of Polish Succession, 1733 to 1735 broke out, Walpole sent no aid to help Austria defend itself against the attacks of France and Spain. Walpole later boasted that, quote, 50,000 men had been, quote, slain this year in Europe and not one Englishman, end quote, end quote. Speck. He judged correctly that the landed classes were more interested in lower taxes than war.
Now in control of both domestic and foreign policy, Walpole took a survey of the entire system of taxation. Walpole's watchwords were, quote, peace, low taxes, unrestrained exports, and unlimited toleration for dissenters, end quote. Hoppet. Walpole constantly sought cheaper government and better rates on the national debt. He sought to reduce the monopoly of the East India Company and failed, but not before obtaining a payment of £200,000 and a lower rate of interest on the debt held by the company. He loosened restrictions on colonial trade, and faced with the collusion between customs officers and smugglers, he sought to shift the burden of taxation from the point of entry to the point of sale. By doing so, he could reduce both customs and the land tax at the same time. By 1730, he was able to reduce the land tax to two shillings on the pound, down from four during the War of the Spanish Succession. His goal was to eliminate it altogether. Footnote. In 1732, Walpole reported the findings of a committee to inspect frauds and abuses in the customs houses. It found that six customs officers had been murdered and 250 assaulted in the previous nine years. End of footnote. The policy of reducing the land tax was naturally popular with Tory squires and the great Whig landowners alike. It comes as no surprise, then, that this master manipulator should pursue peace and foreign policy since it allowed him to appease his would-be opponents by lowering the land tax. The Whigs were liberals of the grandiose sort, believing their leadership in conjunction with the crown was the best way to secure liberty, a liberty which they defined in Lockean terms as being rooted in private property. But those who held out as Tories, being relatively less wealthy, nonetheless embraced a fairly principled liberalism of their own, rooted in their opposition to arbitrary government and their preoccupation with corruption. Thus many Tories found little difficulty in switching to the new Whig principles in exchange for renewed access to the court. The wiggery of Walpole was not demanding. In the countryside, loyal Tory families did remain resilient and could make life difficult for their comrades who defected to the Whigs. Stability may have been more apparent than real. Footnote. Quote, for example, when one of their aristocratic leaders, Earl Gower, joined Henry Pelham, the result of the general election of 1747 was rioting of almost unparalleled ferocity in Gower's home county of Staffordshire. But between the end footnote, but between the two parties there was no real quarrel over the nature of the state and both supported the expansion of private property inland through enclosures. The so-called agrarian depression, 1730 to 50. With a slump in both agriculture and trade, the British economy during the first half of the 18th century scarcely seemed poised for an industrial revolution. Low grain prices between 1670 and 1750 led to heavy rent arrears. The York Current reported on the 20th of February, 1739, quote, last Monday, the 12th of February, the best shipping for wheat, the best shipping wheat for six pounds a load, which is so low that it is impossible farmers can live and pay their rents at such prices, and as wool likewise bears so low a price, unless some care be speedily taken, and the people eased of the present heavy taxes, most of the lands of the kingdom will be flung up into the landlord's hands." End quote. Yet what stands out as the most remarkable fact of the early 18th century was that the output and productivity of agriculture were rising during a period marked by long bouts of agricultural depression. Despite falling prices, rents rose, quote, remarkable as it may seem, end quote, Wilson. If rents were rising, why was this period widely viewed as a period of agrarian hardship? Long, excuse me, not long. After 1660, the long period of rising prices for agricultural goods 
that had lasted since the 1520s came to a close, a long period of economic expansion from the 1620s to the 1750s facilitated a vast improvement in agriculture. The concept of, quote, improvement, end quote, had been in the air since at least the mid-16th century. It now became the mantra of a movement that was transforming British agriculture in entirely new ways. The period was characterized by a demographic pause and expanding supplies, with an overall trend of falling prices, interrupted by periods of poor harvest, prompting price spikes. As laborers enjoyed cheaper bread, real incomes rose. The data suggests that nominal incomes rose as well. The slow rate of population growth would have suppressed the growth in the number of able-bodied workers during a time of expanded employment of waged labor on farms and in manufacturers. Overall, low prices and expanding real incomes created a favorable environment for what we would refer to today as, quote, import substitution, end quote. The depth of domestic demand was increasing rapidly and expectations were rising, quote, the periodic fair was already declining in importance by 1720. Its place as a method of distribution was increasingly taken by the weekly market and the shop, end quote. I missed a footnote here. Table 3.1 indicates that wages in Lancashire grew by 50% between 1700 and 1750, and by another 75% between 1750 and the late 1780s. These percentages reflect nominal wages only. When we take into consideration falling bread prices, real incomes for laboring people in Lancashire grew by much more. And footnote. British consumers began to find an increasing variety of foreign articles available in local markets from coffee, tea, sugar, tobacco, and molasses to Indian prints and porcelains from East Asia. As meat and dairy prices held stable and incomes rose, Britons... Britons... How do you say that? Time for... Google. I guess if you're British you know that, but I don't... Mm, come on. Come on. Britons. Britons, okay. There you are. British consumers began to find an increasing variety of foreign articles available in local markets, from coffee, tea, sugar, tobacco, and molasses, to Indian prints and porcelains from East Asia. As meat and dairy prices held stable and incomes rose, Britons ate more meat. They bought better quality furniture, including better clocks. The metal trades were expanding in Midlands and South Yorkshire, as Britons were buying more and cheaper harnesses, quote, brass locks, buttons, candlesticks, and nails, end quote. While exports, quote, certainly made some contributions to this activity, end quote, the main stimulus was domestic demand. Indeed, the increasing output of glasswares, pig iron, textiles, and so on is often taken as a function of foreign demand. But for A.H. John, what is of, quote, vital significance, end quote, is the, quote, demand released by increased agricultural productivity, end quote. John. The only plausible explanation for how it was possible to have falling grain prices and rising rents at the same time is that the continued expansion of improved agriculture meant that the rate of productivity in agriculture continued to climb during a period of low prices, and even as the resultant overproduction had a further depressing effect on prices, increasing yields per acre meant more value was being realized out of the same amount of land, thus allowing rents to rise and the food supply to increase. This was a historically novel response to agrarian depression. Under conditions of peasant-based farming, low prices bring about a decrease in production. But in early 18th century England, the ability of capitalist tenant farmers to respond to market prices by intensifying rather than withdrawing production marked the, the approach 
to a nearly complete conversion to capitalist principles governing agriculture. As improved agriculture spread, more and more land was subjected to the competitive pressures of the market. These pressures compelled farmers to innovate, resulting in further productivity gains. Rising rates of productivity led to falling prices on the one hand and still afforded the possibility for rents to rise. Falling prices meant higher real wages, which in turn meant greater overall consumer demand. Higher domestic demand stimulated imports as falling prices stimulated exports. Britain became a net exporter of grain. Footnote. Ashton provides a succinct summary of the conditions of agriculture during the period. Quote, Agriculture had its peculiar features. Its techniques differed from place to place. As it, of its varied products, a large part was consumed on the spot. The esteem that attached to ownership of the soil affected its progress. But generally, like other callings, it was ruled by the forces of the market. End quote. Indeed, in examining Gregory King's, excuse me, in examining Gregory King's economic tables of 1688, Dean and Cole find that only quote, cottagers and paupers end quote, could be treated as subsistence producers, and they account for only five and a half percent of the population of England at the time. Even though quote, interpretation of his categories suggests that between seventy and eighty percent of the occupied population was primarily engaged in agriculture. End quote. Writing a century later, Qualcomm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, distinguished, quote, no cottager class as such, end quote, Dean and Cole, reach a similar conclusion to that of Ashton, quote, for centuries, English agriculture had extensive ties of varying strength with the market. And by the 18th century, it was largely organized on a capitalist basis. The typical farmer was not a peasant, peasant toiling for his own subsistence, but an employer of wage labor holding his, land, holding his land as an economic rent from men who not infrequently plowed their profits back into agriculture or into transport industry and trade, end quote. And a footnote. Grain exports peaked around 1745 and remained strong for at least a decade, followed thereafter by a gradual decline and eventually a reversal beginning in the 1760s. Falling prices also facilitated an engrossment of agricultural holdings, wherein improved methods gen generated better yields, contributing to the increasing level of agrarian productivity. So falling agrarian prices, creating a feedback loop, and making the whole process self-reinforcing. To the extent that land was being converted, in, converted to capital, the evidence would seem to point to a process in which capital becomes self-expanding. A second feedback loop involves husbandry, one that has been referred to as a, quote, virtuous circle, end quote. Footnote. Although Burdell references page 62 of Jones' past and present article, one does not find any reference there to a, quote, virtuous circle, end quote. It is therefore unclear whether the specific term, quote, virtuous circle, end quote, originates with Burdell or Jones. End footnote. From the middle of the 17th century, forage crops for husbandry and irrigation began to spread widely, though not uniformly. More fodder from forage crops f allowed for the retention of more animals, and more animals meant more manure. More manure meant better fertilization, which in turn spelled greater yields of corn. Of course, this also meant greater yields of fodder. Thus, a positive feedback loop emerged whereby new methods meant more animals and thus better manuring, which in turn meant more fodder, which could sustain even more animals, and so on. Jones. More manure also afforded new opportunities for improvements in the cultiv cultivability of less fertile soils, allowing for their continuous cultivation. This was especially the case for the lighter sandy soils of southern England, which had hitherto been mainly employed for pasturage. As a result of this virtuous circle, quote, English grain output increased automatically, effortlessly, so to speak, to the point of exceeding home demand, hence the fall in the price of cereals, which were increasingly exported until 1760, end quote. Burdell. <laughs> 
It is important to note that none of these processes were to be found operating in France. The agronomist Arthur Young, during his tours of the French countryside between 1787 and 1789, noted that threefold rotations on open fields were scrupulously observed and found that while France enjoyed a climate more favorable to agriculture than that in England, this disadvantage was more than offset in England by improvements wholly lacking in France. Comnenel and Wright. Another feedback loop that we can identify, one involving brewing and distilling, might be seen as a way of short-circuiting the previous process. These industries produced huge amounts of spent grain left over from the infusion of barley and malt, as well as, quote, wash, end quote, left over after the spirits had been distilled out from the vat, leaving vast quantities of waste materials which provided an excellent source of feed for cattle and pigs. While brewers typically sold their offals, their quote offals, end quote, off premises, distillers could feed hogs completely on their unmalted grains without supplementing beans or peas. As a result, the primary distillers brought hogs into their own operation and set up fattening operations of their own. The result was pork of lower quality, but also of lower price. In 1745, when prices were still near their lowest point, a complaint by farmers in the form of a petition led to an investigation by Parliament which concluded that the fall in hog prices could not be blamed on the distillers. By 1750, the primary distillers were fattening around 100,000 hogs for market and provisioning another 20,000 or more for the vic victualling office. Matthias Thus, urbanization contributed to an expansion of brewing and distilling, which in their own way supported the expansion of husbandry, which in turn helped to sustain the population of growing cities. A fourth feedback loop involved the relations between agricultural and non-agricultural labor. In the period 1700 to 1750, we begin to see new forces emerge that draw labor away from the countryside. New developments in transportation provided demand for labor, and, and an upward effect on wages. There developed new seasonal migrations to coastal towns such as Newcastle upon Tyne, where additional labor for loading coal was needed. Cheap and unskilled labor was sought, and this often meant a preference for women and children. A permanent migration to the larger towns also developed to meet the demand of an expansion of urban manufacturing. Quote, London, of course, exercised the greatest pull, but other industrial centers like Birmingham, Sheffield, and Manchester also attracted their quota, end quote. Agrarian conditions were harsh and entry into apprentice trades difficult for rural agriculturalists, and they were thereby compelled to seek buy employments locally through seasonal migration or to migrate to cities in search of full-time employment. The growth of cities and towns, in turn, placed greater demand on the domestic market for food and manufactured goods, permitting further improvements in agriculture and expansion of manufactures. This tendency was more pronounced on the heavier clay soils of the Midlands, where arable lands were being converted to pasture, resulting in the release of labor from the land and possibly canceling the effect of the South's more intensive cultivation and greater demand for labor. Footnote. In a similar vein, Burdell outlines the process by which, in his, fir in his view, the crisis of the 17th century promoted the Industrial Revolution. First, it encouraged high-yield agriculture capable of meeting demands resulting from the sudden demographic explosion after 1750. Second, it promoted the rise of cottage manufacturing, which in turn provided a malleable and trained workforce, a reserve labor force on which the Industrial Revolution would draw. Burdell comments that the Industrial Revolution would draw on a workforce trained by cottage manufacturing, quote, rather than on the strict agricultural workforce which maintained its previous levels contrary to assumptions made by commentators from Marx to the present day, end quote. 
Bedell would apparently credit improved agricultural productivity with creating the conditions for the growth of cottage manufacturing, but apparently wants to downplay or ignore the impact of agriculture on divorcing the direct producers from the means of production, whether or not they go on to acquire industrial skills. End footnote. Smaller farmers in the Midlands now faced falling prices and competition from the extension of farming in the South. They tried and failed to pass legislation, quote, quote, to pr suppress the improvements in the southern parts, end quote, end quote. Walridge, 1669, cited in John, 1965. Others sought to suppress the sowing of clover in the Midlands. A fifth feedback loop could be identified in the self-sustaining relationship between the expanding domestic market and the improvements in transportation infrastructure, including roads, river, and coastal navigation. England's roads had a reputation as being among the worst in Europe. Whereas the Roman roads were built by state-employed soldiers, road repair had been a local affair since medieval times in England. The statute for mending of highways of 1555 placed responsibility on parish surveyors. Starting in 1696, turnpikes were established to private trust, responding to the strength of the local economy, the volume of transport, and profitability. According to the movement slowed Accordingly, the movement slowed during the period of low agricultural prices, but picked up again in the 1750s. Efforts to, to improve the navigability of rivers also began in the 16th century. Slowed by the wars with France, the pace picked up again between 1719 and 1721. Improved navigation provided a cheaper means of transporting bulky goods, especially coal. At the same time, improvement in coastal shipping involved the development of ports, docks, and harbors, the use of buoys, improvements in lighting, dredging, and the building of piers. Coal shipments from the Tyne, traveling along the east coast, 70% of it going to London, rose from over 400,000 tons in 1660. In the 1660s, to over 600,000 tons by 1730 to 1, and nearly 800,000 tons in 1750. Got some footnotes here. Since funds for investment were crucial to the success of the trust, the widespread though not complete success of the various trusts reflected widespread confidence of investors in the health of local economies and in the profitability of more active links. Black writes, quote, The desire of local merchants and manufacturers for growth was important, but turnpikes were not just commercial ventures. Trusts were dominated by noblemen and the squirearchy. Never heard that word before, squirearchy and the turnpikes were seen as a form of improvement, end quote. He seems to be suggesting that the gentry approached the trust with a lack of self-interest and even that a selfless commitment to the spirit of improvement was more important than the profit motive in driving the effort to improve the roadways. This seems to contradict his earlier statement. Quote, Rather than following some master plan, the road system came in large part to reflect the degree of dynamism of individual trust and the ability of particular routes to produce revenue, quote, end quote. Many estates owners were anxious to enhance transport systems in general, although those with coal and other minerals on their estates, improvements in water navigation, which greatly lowered cost of transporting bulk products, were a, great, a greater priority. Landlords renting to farmers had a clear motive to support cost-cutting improvements in transport, and agricultural goods were better placed to benefit from roadway improvements than coal and other minerals. End of footnote. The next footnote. Compared with what Block calls the, quote, scant improvement in, excuse me, compared with what Black calls the, quote, scant improvement in the conditions of marine transport, end quote. The growth of the merchant marine had for far larger implications. 
Wilson comments, quote, Put in terms of the balance of payments, the girth of the mercantile marine meant that what had often been an invisible import item was turning perceptibly into a profitable item of invisible export. While island, inland transports might remain poor, the British economy was being provided with an increasingly efficient system of external transport, exploiting an ingeniously protected market. End, quote. End of footnote. These improvements in navigation and the development of a national turnpike system set Britain apart from its neighbors because these improvements came into being not through government initiative and finance, but through private enterprise at the regional level responding to commercial imperatives. While customers resented the tolls, farmers, landlords, mine, own, mine owners, and master manufacturers all benefited from the steady fall in transport costs and times, stimulating further economic growth and more demand for cheaper, faster transportation. One second. Eighteenth century Britain was prominent was a prominent contributor to the field of agrarian literature. Between sixteen ninety two and seventeen fifty, a significant number of books and periodicals on improved methods of farming appeared. Footnote Contemporary titles included John Houghton, a collection for the improvement of husbandry and trade, Timothy Norse, Campania Folix or a discourse of the benefits and improvements of husbandry. Thomas, 6th Earl of Haddington, the short treatise on forest trees, aquatics, evergreens, fences, and grass seeds, 1735. In 1700, probably one of every two adult males was still engaged in agriculture. Quote, a proportion that probably had not differed much for a long period of time, end quote. Hayes and Rogers, 1997. End of footnote. The early 18th century saw an, a remarkable spread of technical innovation in agriculture in terms of mechanical devices, the floating of water meadows, and the spread of new planting techniques. Tull's introduction of the said seed drill in 1701 marked a major development, and Tull soon followed up by introducing the horse hoe. In the 1730s, the Rotherham plow was introduced. New planting techniques included the widening use of artificial grasses, clover, as well as sainfoin and lucerne, and the growing turnips, the growing of turnips as a fodder crop within the rotation. This count Charles quote, Turnip and quote Townsend popularized turnip planting in the 1730s. With more fodder, better grasses, and more land available for pasture, the food supply for animals was improved. As, quote, new possibilities of crop rotation, end quote, were realized, quote, better use could be made of the land by the extension of convertible husbandry and by further specialization according to types of soil, end quote. Coleman. Combined with tall straight rows, turnips yielded better economies of cost and greater yields. The result was better profits for farmers and higher rents for landlords. Footnote. Turnips aside, the expanded cultivation of specific crops may not signify the spread of new techniques, but is indicative of growing demand and new markets for such crops and of a growing commercialization of agriculture. Thus, potatoes became a field crop in this period. Apple and pear orchards arose in the West Country, while apple and cherry orchards appeared in mid-Kent. Vegetable gardening expanded in the vicinity of London. The hop excise in 1711 encouraged its growth. Output rose from 9 million pounds between 1712 and 1721 to 19 million in the period of 1745 to 56. Likewise, the cultivation of flax, hemp, madder, woad, saffron, wheat, and barley 
also expanded in this period with exports of wheat and barley on the increase. End footnote. Ashton finds that, quote, nearly all the improvements of agricultural technique of which there is record were made on land already enclosed or in the process of enclosure, end quote. On the other hand, enclosure did not automatically equate with improvement or greater efficiency, improved drainage, adapting to new methods and introducing new machinery required outlays that not every farmer or landlord could afford. If the source of agricultural innovation was profitability alone, then we should not expect to see innovation in this period of agrarian hardship and low profits. But in an emerging agrarian capitalist system, agrarian distress heightened the competitive pressures of market-based agriculture. Thus, in such a time of distress, investing in the means to improve agricultural efficiency could save the landowner and his tenants from bankruptcy. The small holder, quote, was at the mercy of the weather, but he was much more at its mercy than his more progressive and larger neighbors, as they increased their output, and as the increase for and as the increase was reflected in a larger national output, it was their prices that ruled the market, end quote. Footnote. Wilson might better have stated that while the little man was at the mercy of the weather, he was much more at the mercy of his larger neighbors. He, Wilson continues, quote, Quite apart from the short-term fluctuations caused by the weather, the price structure of an increasingly commercial capitalistic market for agricultural produce was shaping against the small peasant farmer, end quote. End footnote. His distress was compounded by falling prices. The smallholder's distress was compounded by falling prices, resulting from productivity gains on mostly larger farms, gains which he lacked sufficient capital to affect. For most landowners, manorial rents were no longer of great economic consequence. Their income came mostly from tenant farmers, whose advantage lay in seeking to continually lower the cost of production. Footnote. Coleman observes that, quote, the market for grain approached that of a perfect economic market. No individual producer could control prices or rents, end quote. End footnote. As the, quote, third class, end quote, that defines agrarian capitalism, landlords were directly affected by the competitive pressures of the emerging land and grain markets, but were not themselves directly subject to those pressures. As we shall discuss shortly, the competitive pressures they faced were real. They simply were driven by a different logic, the competition for status, not by the logic of the capitalist market as such. Landlords could afford to relax spending on investments in their estates and buy more luxury items. The tenant farmer could not. In the earlier period of agrarian depression, 1690 to 1715, it was high agrarian prices driven by recurring bad harvest that brought hardship. The distress was compounded by high wartime taxation and a slump in trade. Agrarian and industrial laborers were also adversely affected by high grain prices. I missed a footnote, but here, so here's the footnote. Marx, Part 7, Chapter, I don't know what that says, XLVII, -I -I. does, that, does that mean 28, maybe? I don't know. I don't even know if there's 28, is there 28 chapters in Volume 3? I don't know. Struggle to come to terms with the, quote, three classes, end quote, when he wrote about the, quote, Trinity formula, end quote. It does not appear that Marx ever fully appreciated the role that landlords played in facilitating the transition to capitalism through an agrarian capitalism that was unique to England, despite seeing England's route as the, quote, classic one. 
and footnote. Agrarian and, and agrarian and industrial laborers were also adversely affected by high grain prices, but in the so-called agrarian depression of the 1730s and 1740s, we have falling prices and good harvests. Footnote. Both Coleman and Minge cite Wimpy as one contemporary to whom the results of improvement were clear. Quote, All history cannot furnish 20 such years of fertility and abundance as from 1730 to 1750, when the average prices were the lowest ever known. Another reason we assign to the fall of prices is the small improvements made in agriculture in the last 50 or 60 years, end quote. End footnote. Real incomes for laborers were rising, however, rents piled up and many farms fell into disuse. Landlords, quote, were forced to write off such arrears to make concessions to provide capital for farm buildings or improvements in order to retain good tenants on whom they so much depended, end quote. Coleman. It is the, quote, sudden appearance of heavy arrears of rent, end quote, writes Min Gay, quote, which justifies the view that the failure of rents to rise at this time is a sign of depression, end quote, Min Gay. Writing in 1785, the economist postulated that agrarian stagnation and the decrease of purchasing power for landlords and farmers offset gains in other areas of the economy. Similarly, similarly, Habakkuk argued that low agricultural prices, quote, had a depressing effect on agricultural investment and indirectly on the demand for industrial goods, end quote. Habakkuk, as cited in Dean and Cole. But H. A. H. John argues that this thesis does not hold up to scrutiny. He argues that buoyancy in the economy was sustained throughout the period, and that on the whole this was not a period of economic stagnation. Farmers were increasing their stock. Evidence of labor migration suggests economic growth in multiple sectors, and the overall increase in the volume and range of consumer goods as well as the growth of the linen industry suggest a period of considerable growth. <laughs> Two additional trends bring the stagnation thesis into question. First, luxury consumption increased, and this increased, di increased diversion of capital from productive uses may mask the overall increase in agrarian incomes. Landlords began to spend more, quote, they had armies of servants, end quote. Rule. Some landlords were lucky enough to find minerals or coal or simply converted their properties into fortunes when they sold out to urbanization. Secondly, landlords were investing more capital in improvements and hence sinking more of their wealth into productive investment. In general, landlords could consolidate farms on old enclosure areas and their investment allowed them to reshape and relet farms at higher rents. Footnote, quote, Thereafter, the farmers tended to take on a large share of the burden of investment in agricultural improvement. End quote. Rule, 1992. Indeed, as Minge writes, during the, quote, depression, end quote, years of 1730 to 1750, quote, the landlord's expenses for repairs and new construction of farm buildings, fences, gates, embankments, and cottages were generally heavy, end quote. But such outlays declined in the decade between 1750 and 1760, quote, the burdens of making repairs and the expenses of any improvements were now largely thrust upon the tenant, end quote. End footnote. We must conclude, therefore, that the complaints of distress were coming from the lesser gentry who had less resources to invest in improvement and keep up but those who were engrossing and consolidating enormous estates. In other words, this was not so much a period of depression or stagnation as one of differentiation in the countryside. This applied to the tenants as well. Landlords naturally preferred wealthier tenants than those with experience at making successful improvements and turning out more abundant harvests. 
Falling grain prices facilitated differentiation between agrarian producers with low outputs and relatively high costs and those with high outputs, causing the share of investment to shrink relative to the total cost of operation. Footnote. Not everyone, therefore, rejoiced at harvest time, but the capitalist tenant farmer did. Wilson describes the capitalist tenant farmer as the, quote, human pivot on whom the real, excuse me, on whom the new rural arrangements turned. He was the symbol of a new society that no longer relied on customary relationships but based on the ownership or part ownership of land, but on legal and contractual relationships designed for a world of commerce. He survived so long as he could honor his contract and pay his rent, end quote. Wilson. End footnote. Quote, Farms were growing larger. The old idea that a holding should be a size sufficient to maintain a family and no more was beginning to give way to a belief in bigger units of production. These could introduce division of labor, utilize larger capital, and supply markets more efficiently. End quote. Ashton, 1964. The new idea was that a farmer should produce thrice what he consumed, with the other thirds allocated to rent and expenses related to production, including hired labor. There was very little about the emerging logic of agrarian capitalism that favored smaller farmers. All producers were increasingly drawn into a real agrarian capitalist market. Footnote. The tenant farmer was a category of a real socioeconomic agent the tenant farmer as a real as a category for a real socioeconomic agent was defined by social relationships built on new non-customary foundations since his entire production operation was geared towards the market any use of productive output for immediate consumption for the self-subsistence of himself and his family were secondary concerns the rising income of a growing number of farmers was laying the foundation for the emergence of a middle class able to afford and provide effective demand to stimulate the domestic market in household consumer goods, soap, cotton garments, tea, and sugar, and, quote, it was the large proportionate size of the middle income groups which distinguished English society, end quote. End footnote. All producers were increasingly drawn into a real agrarian into a real agrarian capitalist market. While the older peasant way of life was fading, local circumstances could aid its preservation. Footnote quote, There were still many owner occupiers of small holdings of ten acres or less who could still borrow free of charge the quote town plow. End quote. It was said that in Cumberland, juries could always be relied upon to find for the tenant in any landlord-tenant dispute. End footnote. The open field system was not entirely without its advantages. Rents were generally lower, and ready access to the means of subsistence combined with rights of grazing gathering firewood and fishing on the commons afforded a degree of protection from the market. Footnote. In later chapters, we will see more clearly how custom and parochialism factored into efforts to resist market pressures. End footnote. Nor was the old system completely inflexible. Footnote. Quote. It has been said that the necessity of conforming to the communal timetable for sowing and harvesting, of following the agreed rotation, and observing the customs of the village or manor, ensured that cultivation did not fall below certain standards. Open field farmers could agree to exchange strips so as to get larger contiguous holdings, and sometimes they added a crop to the customary cycle or made arrangements to hold meadows in severalty.
Severity. S-E-V-E-R-A-L-T-Y. There is no need to think of the arrangement as inflexible, but it was unfriendly to the individual who wanted to move ahead of his fellows, end quote. End of footnote. By adopting... By adapting to improved methods, by specializing in husbandry, dairying peasants, or small farmers working on common fields still unenclosed could remain viable, giving landlords less incentive to enclose. Nevertheless, the overall trend was for the gradual disappearance of the small producer, primarily copyholders, especially in regions where dairying or conversion to permanent pasture could not be substituted for traditional agriculture. A minority of copyholders managed to transform their share in the reapportioned fields upon enclosure of the village into a productive capitalist operation. But whether or not their land was enclosed, most could not afford to invest in improving the drainage systems, much less to put up hedges or build stone fences. They remained uncompetitive. Their best option was often to seek the highest price for their land, upon the sale of which they joined the ranks of the growing members of cottagers, wage laborers, or landless poor. The freeholders held a clear advantage over the copyholder. By transmuting the value of this land into stock, seed, and manure for fertilizer, he obtained the necessary funds to invest in improvements. Footnote. In 1688, George Gregory, excuse me, in 1688, Gregory King reckoned that farmers and freeholders made up 5.5% of the population, with, quote, better freeholders, end quote, making up less than 1%. End footnote. Freeholders were often the first to enclose their properties by agreement and or by unity of possession, and so we see yet another self-reinforcing process at work for the failure of small producers in the face of competition from large farms with improving techniques reinforced the tendency for concentration as these lands were absorbed into larger farms. Larger farms operating on an economy of scale could afford greater investment in improvements, further tipping the scales against the small producer. A great deal of ink has been spilt disputing the assertions of Marx and others, to the effect that the peasantry was forcibly expropriated. Footnote. Marx's description of the process is quite dramatic. For example, he writes, quote, The fraudulent alienation of the state domains, the robbery of the common lands, the usurpation of feudal and clan property, and this transformation into private property over, under circumstances of reckless terrorism, there excuse me, were just so many idyllic methods of primitive accumulation. They conquered the field for capitalistic agriculture, made the soil part and parcel of capital, and created for the town industries the necessary supply of a, quote, free, end quote, and outlawed proletariat, end quote. It is noteworthy, however, that in quoting contemporary accounts of the tearing down of villages, he notes that, quote, the complaints of these old chroniclers are always exaggerated, end quote. Marx, Marx's sweeping narrative on the topic deals less in the specifics of enclosure than in the overall process of transforming land into capital and peasants into proletarians. End footnote. Cusmal claims that the opinion... Cosmal claims that opinion is now widespread, that, quote, the commons were purchased rather than stolen from the commoners, end quote, and there is limited evidence to support the idea of a, quote, deliberate and calculated expropriation, end quote. Cosmal and Wilson. Many, if not most, villages were enclosed by legal arrangement. In such cases, however, peasants did not always give up their rights without a legal battle. What is indisputable, however, is that the loss 
of access to the commons and the subsequent full expropriation of the peasantry brought hardship and uncertainty to the poor. Footnote. In part, this is indisputable when one considers the contemporaries that contemporaries were quite aware of the hardships enclosure could bring about. When in 1759, Reverend John Loder, the lord of the manor of Hinton Waldrist in Oxfordshire, informed his tenants that he wanted to enclose the land, they replied that it would create much hardship for those who only had short tenor, that it would be expensive to grow and maintain hedges, and would be divisive, end quote. Excuse me. Quote, "'Tis likely to create uneasiness amongst us as long as we live, and one will be ever thinking another's land better than his, end quote. Despite this, an Enclosure Act was passed the following year, end quote. Black, 2001. Likewise, when in 1712 the Marquis of Powys enclosed Benefield in Northamptonshire, quote, even the local gentry thought this imposed great injustices on the poor, end quote. Wilson. End footnote. This raises the question of how it has had been decided that common law property rights should trump tradition and community interest. How enclosure was accomplished and what its immediate effects were is in some sense trivial beside the fact that millions of cultivators of the soil lost access to the commons and then, even if they were bought out, lost possession of land to till and were, quote, hurled, end quote, into the ranks of men, women, and children, seeking to sell their labor for a wage, even as the rich continued to consolidate their estates. As the Hanoverian era opened, the late 17th century trend of expending Enormous sums on country houses and their accompanying landscaped parks rose to new levels of extravagance. Astonishing observers, nature was brought to serve a Promethean arrogance. Hillocks were, Hillocks were leveled, streams dammed and diverted, lakes manufactured, and trees planted by the thousands. Great houses were built from income, incomes derived from vast land holdings or offices of state. The construction of 200 room houses on parks stretching for thousands of acres testifies to a degree of wealth unknown since the days of Caesar and Crassus. Sir Edward Coke amassed enough land throughout his lifetime to provide land for all his children, a true exception in the era of strict primogeniture. Footnote. Most younger sons moved to the city in search of a career in trade in the bureaucracy or the military. Coke accomplished this feat in spite of losing 79,000 pounds, the equivalent of approximately 7 million today, in the scandal of the South Sea Bubble. End footnote. It took Thomas Coke 30 years, 1734 to 64, and 90,000 pounds to build Holcomb Hall near the northern sea coast of Norfolk. The project continued, however, and by 1800 the surrounding park covered 3,000 acres. Footnote. The estate today is still active and still privately owned, employing some 160 persons covers 25,000 acres. End footnote. Even this was no match for Lord Lonsdale's 4,000 acre Lothar Park, or not to be outdone the Duke of Norfolk's 5,000 acre estate in Cumberland. At these lofty heights of the elite, there could be little social mobility. 
A healthy rent roll squeezed from the tenants thanks to improved farming methods might only encourage higher aspirations of elegance and grandiosity. Footnote. Not all landlords saw the importance of investing in improved agriculture. Whether or not they did would influence the long-term prospects of their estate. Many, for many, it was certainly possible to spend productively and conspicuously at the same time. At the cost of, end footnote, at the cost of running an ever more luxurious establishment, as the cost of running an ever more luxurious establishment accumulated, it became necessary to carry a running debt in order to maintain sufficient liquidity. For many, this would lead to eventual bankruptcy. The seething animosity between the two parties in the first 15 years of the 18th century became more under, becomes more understandable if we consider that in order to keep up with sumptuous lifestyle, the sumptuous lifestyle he had known, many an old Tory squire found himself borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Chronically in debt, it is no wonder that he turned his wrath upon the, quote, placeman, end quote, profiting from schemes of lending to private interests and the state alike. Quote, Some changes followed directly or indirectly from the effects of civil war and interregnum. During the interregnum, there was confiscation of and sale of some, quote, delinquent, end quote, royalist lands, as well as to those as well as those of church and crown. Other royalists sold or borrowed to pay fines in order to, quote, compound, end quote, for their support of the wrong side. But at the restoration, the sales of confiscated lands, though not other sales, were invalidated and most royalists regained their lands. It seems unlikely that as a direct consequence of these forced transactions, there occurred any substantial transfer of land to lawyers, merchants, soldiers, rich citizens, and the like, who were then responsible for putting into operation the improved methods of farming and estate management. Nevertheless, many former royalists and other landowners whose lands bore heavy debt charges, whether incurred because of or before the, quote, troubles, end quote, found themselves in a very disadvantageous situation as rents and prices fell in the post-restoration years. Legal development since the earlier 17th century had facilitated the growth of a mortgage market, and some money-lending scriveners did very well out of this flourishing business." End quote. As the 18th century progressed, however, there were fewer bankruptcies, even though the debts carried were larger. What had changed was this revolution, was that the revolution in the financial system had vastly improved the supply of credit, and as land was considered good security, bankers were eager to lend to landholders. There were no urban fortunes to rival those of the countryside. But this is not to say that there were no urban fortunes being made. Moreover, urban professionals often sought to buy their way into the gentry by purchasing estates and with landlords increasingly taking up residence in the town. In these ways, the rural-urban distinction was at least beginning to become blurred. Wealthy merchants, lawyers, bankers, and contractors professed a longing to go into the country to establish a family nest in an ostentatious display, quote, to prove to oneself and others that one was as grand as one's neighbor by being palpably more grand." End quote. Footnote. Quote, a foreign invest excuse me, a foreign visitor in seventeen twenty seven considered the elite of London's merchants to be wealthier than the quote, sovereign princes of Germany and Italy, end quote, end quote. rule. End footnote. Joining their quest were, quote, iron masters and a miscellany of professional men and placemen. <laughs> like their Tudor predecessors, they acquired landed estates, built splendid new houses, married their children into the peerage or into older families, and started new landed families. Many, especially the parvenu amongst them, got themselves buried <coughs> 
under some of the biggest pieces of memorial sculpture to be seen in England churches, almost all dating between 1650 and 1750." End quote. Coleman. Many of the estates they purchased were indeed from old families, no longer able to keep up the pace. Rule concern, concurs with the Stone's notion that England did not have an, uh, quote, open elite, end quote, at least among the families of the aristocracy. Footnote. This book looks at the market for country houses to inquire whether the apparent myth of a, quote, open elite, end quote, into and out of which flowed merchants, financiers, and industrialists could move freely. The idea that the landed gentry was regularly replenished by successive waves of fresh, newly bourgeois outsiders, writes the Stones, quote, is clearly not more than a hoary myth, which should now be laid reverently to rest, end quote. Quote, during the whole 340-year period covered by this study, there were only 137 men of business who bought their way into the elite in our three countries, end quote. End footnote. Quote, the 18th century titled aristocracy was one of the most closed in Europe despite the fact that there was no legal definition of noble blood, end quote. Rule. The Peaks, writes Rule, could not be scaled, but he asked, quote, what of the foothills, end quote. Contrary to the stones, Rule finds that the way was not barred for men of new money to be able to climb into the ranks of the gentry and suggests the issue was not access but attitude. The newcomers were not inclined to adopt the substance of the old ways. In fact, most of these wealthy townspeople who purchased rural estates maintained their urban residencies. Excuse me, residences. Is there a difference between saying something's a residence and a residency? I guess residency is more conceptual, I don't know. During the periods of agrarian depression, they might speculate on urban construction schemes as an alternative to investing in the countryside. Absentee landlordship grew, and as a result, owners needed to hire stewards to manage their estates. Footnote. The steward assumed broad responsibilities. Cottagers and tenants alike typically negotiated their leases with the steward, not the landlord. Stewards often took charge of dispensing charity to locals. On very large estates, the position required men skilled in assessing and negotiating rents and leases, good knowledge of farming methods, and the ability to oversee the employment of dozens of men. Their salaries were high. Quote, it took the Duke of Bridgewater six years in the 1720s to persuade a yeoman farmer to act as his steward, eventually getting him for 100 pounds, a house and a horse at the Duke's cost, end quote. Rule, 1992. Even owners of modest properties required stewards in their absence. Here, far less skill was required, but a strong knowledge of and ability at effecting agrarian improvement would have been highly sought qualities in a steward. For the absentee owner, expecting to maximize his rents, a manager who could maximize efficiency and productivity was crucial. But even an excellent steward could not prevent a crisis if the lord of the house overspent. End footnote. Their position served to maintain or increase the social distance between the very rich and the very poor. On the larger estates, the sheer scale and increasing complexity of the enterprise made the steward indispensable. Quote, he was in a unique position to speed the rate of rural change and rural progress, end quote. Wilson. Well,
The distress of the lesser gentry came in a period of low prices, but we find little cause to describe the decades between 1730 and 1750 as a period of agrarian depression. Rather, it was a dynamic period involving agrarian differentiation or stratification. While some may recall a particular period of, as one of distress, others meanwhile prospered mightily. Barring an analysis of how surplus is appropriated and property is expropriated, the tendency will be to view economic failure as individual failure, to take advantage of the opportunities others managed to exploit and by which they gained. The return to war in the 45. Walpole, Walpole's efforts to shift the burden of taxation onto the consumer were welcomed by merchants as well as landlords, for they corresponded neatly with the growing sentiment among wealthy merchants and landowners that laboring people were too well off and should be taxed. And evidence of this could be seen in the increasing ability of working people to have the means to buy luxury items, evidence of a, quote, dangerous spirit of luxury and debauchery which ought to be checked, end quote. Job, 1984. In 1723, Walpole had extended an experimental system, first applied in 1709 to imports of pepper, of holding imports in bonded customs housing houses without exacting customs. The advantage of the system was to stimulate the colonial re-export trade by removing markup for, cons for customs. Goods that traveled inland were subject to a, an in excise payment equivalent to the otherwise forsworn customs duty. The 1723 extension included tea, coffee, and cotton and increased revenues by approximately 120,000 pounds per annum. Now Walpole prepared to add wine and tobacco to the system. To sell this scheme, he presented a report in 1732 on the rampant corruption of the customs system, which could be ameliorated by the drastic reduction in customs duties put forth in his proposal. The uproar that followed demonstrated how Walpole's own reputation for corruption could be used against him. Footnote. The opposition, having rehearsed their arguments in the previous year when the excise on salt was reintroduced after a two-year lapse, set out to inflame public opinion against the scheme, claiming that Walpole sought to unleash an army of officers upon the public to enforce a general excise. Quote, a phrase of plot Paul, excuse me, a phrase of Paul Tenney's, quote, that monster, the excise, that plan of arbitrary power, end quote, caught the public ear. Caricatures and pasconades representing excise as a devouring dragon, a universal tax upon all commodities, especially bread and meat, flooded the country, among them a political ballad, Batrania Excisa, by Put Pulteni. The craftsmen, week by week, invented hideous pictures of its effects. The essays, some of them from Pulteni's pen, bearing in a collected form the title Arguments Against Excises, fed the flames of popular fury. Quote, no slavery, no excise, no wooden shoes, end quote. The last symbol to arbitrary monarchy like that of France became the universal cry. In vain, the ministry dispersed pamphlets unmaking the imposture, end quote. Excise duties were, quote, first levied by Pyme in 1643, but they had always been unpopular in the country, partly because they affected many of the necessities of life and particularly Excuse me, and partly because the activities of the excise officers made evasion of payment very difficult. End quote. End footnote. Walpole admitted defeat, which was be welcomed with delirium. 
the bells of London rang for two days, quote, bonfires blazed in the streets, end quote. Footnote, quote, the effigies of Walpole with a blue paper ribbon of the garter and of a fat woman representing the queen fed the flames. Cockades were worn inscribed, quote, liberty, property, and no excise, end quote, end quote. Leadham interpreted the whole affair as, quote, the triumph of passion and prejudice, excited by the interest of the numerous traders who profited by smuggling against a scientific adjustment of taxation, end quote. Leadham. However, examining the voting on the bill, Speck concludes that Walpole's loss of the support of the commons was due not to the pressure of the London crowd, but to doubts among placemen about the king's backing for Walpole during a moment of crisis. End footnote. The outpouring of popular resistance to the mere idea of a general excise was testimony to the growing power of consumers and rising incomes. The government's attempts to license the sale of spirits between 1729 and the Gin Act of 1736 likewise proved ineffective. Owen. Dwelling houses became dram shops. Quote, a carnival of drunkenness ensued, end quote, which combined with economic distress contributed to widespread protesting during the year of 1736. Footnote. This includes the Porteous Riot of Edinburgh, which involved smuggling and drunkenness. In April, the execution of one Andrew Wilson, a smuggler, led to stones being thrown from the crowd and under the command of one Captain John Porteous, shots being fired into the crowd, killing six and wounding eleven. Porteous was found guilty of murder. Upon obtaining a reprieve from the Queen, Porteous was subsequently hanged by an angry crowd that stormed the prison. The crowd was dispersed. The opposition, led by Carteret, sought to embarrass the ministry over its handling of the Scottish administration. End footnote. With his excise scheme having failed, Walpole was determined to crack down on smuggling. In May of 1736, a bill was introduced to make smuggling punishable by transportation for life. The bill passed despite strong objections from the two heads of the judicature, on the grounds that it included language criminalizing not merely the act of smuggling, but the intent to do so. This only encouraged the smugglers to engage in more violence. The new law failed to address the causes of smuggling, which was rampant. The real problem was that smuggling was made profitable due to the high rate of duties. The fact that the authorities charged with suppressing illicit trade were themselves corrupted did not help matters. Contemporaries complained that smuggling had corrupted the entire nation. Certainly the practice enjoyed widespread legitimacy given that a large volume of goods could be obtained at a better price from smugglers if they could be legitimately obtained at all. Indeed, Walpole himself, quote, despite the savagery of the measures he proposed to suppress smuggling, personally carried his fine French wines past the Custom House, end quote. Winslow, until the 1740s, excuse me, not until the 1740s, would the smuggling crisis come to a head. Footnote. In Sussex, the growing level of violence approached the level of an insurrection. Quote, pitched battles with customs officers aided by soldiers continued of frequent occurrence. In one such near Pevensey in 1744, a hundred mounted smugglers were victorious. End quote. In 1748, the chapter tort excuse me. In 1748, the capture, torture, and murder of a revenue officer and an informer, William Galley and Daniel Chatter, quote, finally fixed the attention of the entire nation. End quote on the smugglers in Sussex, and led to a, quote, extraordinary campaign, end quote, to suppress the practice led by the Duke of Richmond. 
Winslow, 1975, end footnote. When Parliament met in January 1738, the opposition's new weapon against the ministry was a long list of grievances against Spain for harsh treatment and frequent searches of British traders. If smugglers were to receive no mercy from Walpole's ministry, those engaging in illicit trade in the Spanish colonies would receive none either. Since 1713, a thriving illicit traffic had arisen, provoking a clampdown by the Spanish coast guards. Between 1713 and 1731, 180 British ships had been appropriated by Spain. After a law, the clampdown was renewed in 1737, and the cry for reprisals against Spain became an uproar when in March 1738, Captain Jenkins brought his ear to Parliament, pickled in a bottle, which he claimed had been cut off by the Spanish in 1731. Walpole could hardly come out in favor of eliciting trade, but he did commence negotiations with Spain. The Convention of Pardo in 1739 compensated innocent British traders hurt by Spain's activities. In return for enforcing the payment of Spain's outstanding claim of £68,000 from the South Sea Company, the opposition was indignant. A frenzy of public denunciations and lampoons of the ministry ensued. Petitions denouncing the convention poured in. Carteret and Chesterfield led the attack, followed by the Duke of Argyle and the Prince of Wales. Still, the ministry carried on. When the South Sea Company refused payment, Spain in turn suspended the asiento. The uproar now became a torrent. At last, Walpole's guiding principle of appeasing the land of classes with peace and a lower land tax proved incapable of staving off the march to war, a war now known to posterity as the, quote, War of Jenkins' Ear, end quote. Speck and Leadham. The king refused Walpole's resignation. In July 1739, a fighting... As fighting commenced in the West Indies, Walpole came under fire for allowing the ships of the fleet to fall into disrepair. In October, the death of Charles VI of Austria and Prussia's subsequent invasion of Silesia signaled the beginning of the War of Austrian Succession. With Prussia and Austria, with Prussia and Austria at war, quote, the entire continental system constructed by England was a barrier against French aggression. Excuse me. The system constructed by England as a barrier against French aggressions had fallen to pieces in a few weeks, end quote. Footnote. Although Austria and Great Britain briefly found themselves belonging to opposing alliances in the 1720s, the two powers had since the 1690s generally been in an alliance that sought to counterbalance French territorial ambitions in Europe. The assumption, quote, that Austria and Britain were natural allies against French ambitions was deeply rooted in the minds of British statesmen, end quote. Anderson, 1995. Frederick's invasion of Silesia demonstrated that it was not France alone that had territorial ambitions in Europe, that it was not France alone that might be willing to renege on, the, on agreeing to the pragmatic sanction, and that it was not France alone that would happily see the Habsburg Empire dismantled. End footnote. While England, as a signatory of the Pragmatic Sanction, was obliged to come to the aid of Maria Theresa of Austria, King George removed to Hanover and quickly settled a treaty to keep the electorate neutral. News of the agreement proved a decisive blow against Walpole's reputation. After Parliament reconvened in December 1741, the ministry quickly lost its majority on the second vote. By February, Walpole resigned all his offices and was immediately promoted to the House of Lords, accepting the title of Earl of Orford. Footnote. Walpole's ministry had long used the Committee of Privileges and Elections to increase its majority by tossing out the petitions of aggrieved opposition candidates while supporting the grievances of candidates backed by the ministry. Now, this committee had for the first time in recent memory fallen into the hands of the opposition. In 
The unscrupulous methods of this committee were turned against Walpole's government, and anticipating the outcome, Walpole resigned on the 1st of February, one day before the ministry was defeated in a vote of 1741 to... Excuse me. What the fuck? Why does it say 1741? Jesus Christ. The unscrupulous methods of this committee were turned against Walpole's government, and anticipating the outcome, Walpole resigned on the 1st of February, one day before the ministry was defeated in a vote of 241 to 225 to refuse the petition of defeated court candidates at Chippenham in favor of opposition country candidates. Spec 1977. The new Earl of Orford was the subject of an investigation after his downfall as Prime Minister. A motion by Lord Limerick, quote, into the conduct of Robert Earl of Orford during the last ten years, end quote, passed 252 to 245, and a secret committee was struck with Limerick acting as chairman. The committee's results were, according to Leadham, quote, so lame and impotent, end quote, that they, quote, provoked a reaction of opinion in f favor of Orford, end quote. Even an eloquent speech by Pitt in favor of a motion to revive the inquiry failed to move the House, which voted 253 to 186 against in December 1742. End footnote. In finding a success to, excuse me, in finding a successor to Walpole, the king had to choose between two factions of ambitious and self-promoting members of the opposition, and naturally chose against the faction led by Prince Frederick. William Pulteney succeeded as Prime Minister, and John Carteret was chosen to handle foreign policy, excuse me, handle foreign affairs, because he would indulge the king in supporting a pro-Hanoverian policy. As in the past, the policy was deeply unpopular and generated a constant stream of complaints. Britain quickly became a major player in the war, doling out huge subsidies to its allies. And as the center of the conflict shifted to Italy, Carteret promised Sardinia's Charles Emmanuel an annual subsidy of £200,000. In the Netherlands, Hanoverian troops were were put on the payroll in order to secure Dutch participation, and of course Austria, whose existence now depended upon British support, received, received subsidies as well. In 1743, George II led British forces to victory in the battle at Dettingen. Dettingen. It would be the last time a British sovereign would lead his troops in battle. Footnote. Quote. In England, the news of Dettingen aroused an excitement out of proportion to the merits of a victory due rather to the folly of the opposing general, end quote, than to the skill of the Allied army. Quote, the king's courage and that of the young Duke of Cumberland were the theme of universal praise, end quote. After Dettingen, George II hesitated and lost the advantage. Newcastle complained that had the advantage been pressed, France could have been forced to submit, quote, quote, to a reasonable and proper terms of peace, quote, quote. Spec. The perception was that British interests were being sacrificed to Hanoverian interests. Footnote. William Pitt, never timid about insulting the king, charged that England had been, quote, reduced to the status of a, quote, province of a despicable electorate, end quote, end quote. Cited in Spec, 1977. The king announced to Parliament, end footnote, the king announced to Parliament in February 1744 that the young pretender, Charles Edward Stuart, was planning an invasion from France, reminiscent of the first Spanish Armada. The invading fleet was turning away by gale force winds. The invaders lost 12 ships. France and England exchanged declarations of war in March. The, measure, the pressures against a pro-Hanoverian policy were now strained to breaking point, and Carteret resigned under pressure. 
allied with his brother, the Duke of Newcastle. Thomas Pelham holds. Henry Pelham assumed leadership over a new and shaky ministry that became known as the, quote, Broad Bottom Administration, end quote. Being composed of a wide spectrum of politicians, George finally gave up on Hanoverian neutrality and declared Hanover as a principal in the war. He chose his son William, Duke of Cumberland, to lead the campaign. A series of defeats ensued. Footnote. I guess I should finish the sentence. A series of defeats ensued, leading to a truce negotiated by the British, whereby Austria agreed to cede Silesia to Prussia, effectively relinquishing its status as a great power. Footnote. Only in North America were the British triumphant that year, taking Louisbourg, the French garrison, at the mouth of the St. Lawrence. End footnote. The footnote was in the middle of the sentence, so that's why there's some confusion there. In July 1745, quote, Bonnie Prince Charlie, end quote, landed in the Hebrides, of Western Scotland, quote, without a dozen, with, excuse me, with about a dozen companions and hardly any resources, end quote. Footnote. Within weeks he had an army of 1,500 men and in August raised his white, blue, and red standard at Glenfinnan. While Scots as a whole remained divided throughout the affairs, supporters of the young pretender joined for a variety of reasons. Catholics and Episcopalians sought religious reform. Many Scottish nationalists had long opposed what they saw as the subjugation of Scotland by England in the Act of Union. Others simply resented customs and excises imposed on Scottish products. Quote, and doubtless there were those who went along for sheer adventure and hopes of booty, end quote. End footnote. By 17th of September, Charles seized Edinburgh and proclaimed King James VIII of Scotland, and was proclaimed King James VIII of Scotland. On the 21st of September, the rebels routed a British force of some 2,300 under the command of Cope, the resident commander-in-chief in Scotland, near Prestonpans. By early December, the Jacobites, aided in no small way by the atrocious state of the roads in the West Midlands, took Derby. They were less than 130 miles from London. In London, astonishment turned to panic when the news arrived on the 6th of December, quote, Black Friday, end quote. Shops closed in the Bank of England only averted disaster by paying out in sixpences to clients making a run on the bank. But the Jacobites were already in retreat. With less than 5,000 men, the Jacobite army would be no match for an army of 10,000 under Cumberland, and two more armies of the same strength. In April, Cumberland smashed the rebel army of less than 8,000 at Culloden. Vicious reprisals followed. Footnote. Transported to England for trial, rank-and-file members were forced to draw lots. Quote, one in twenty to be hanged, the rest to be transported, end quote. In all, seventy-seven were hanged, drawn and quartered or beheaded. Most declared their allegiance to the Jacobite cause to the end. A few bought their freedom in exchange for betrayal. Three peers were beheaded as traitors, at first celebrated as the savior of the nation. As news of the reprisals filtered back, Cumberland was soon being referred to as, quote, Billy the Butcher, end quote. End footnote. Let's swig here. Let me swig that coffee. Ah. <laughs> 
One of the consequences of the trials was the determination that the hereditary feudal and jurisdictional rights of the Highland clans of Scotland should be abolished under the Disarming Act of 1747. Financial compensation was offered and the forfeited estates were applied to the encouragement of agriculture, fisheries, and the establishment of industry, including instruction in linen and stock weaving. Speck notes that, quote, these acts eradicated as far as legislation could a complete culture and way of life, end quote. Speck. Thereafter, agrarian capitalism would make rapid progress in England. The Jacobite Rebellion touched off yet another crisis in the government. William Pitt managed to sufficiently ingratiate himself with the king to succeed to the post of paymaster of the forces. Pitt now found himself advocating the very subsidies he had thunderously denounced in the past. Quote, subsidies of 400,000 pounds for 50,000 Austrians, 300,000 pounds for the king of Sardinia, 310,000 pounds for 18,000 Hanoverians were carried in one day by 255 to 122 votes, end quote. Lead em. The national debt, which stood at nearly 47 million pounds in 1739, would soar to over 76 million pounds by 1748. By 1746, peace negotiations were underway at Breda. Far away in India, British victories were French over French ships in the fall of 1747 would immediately contribute to British supremacy in India. France's victory over the Allies at Lawfield signaled a coming French invasion of Holland. But when the Whigs returned, 338 seats against 97 opposition Whigs and 117 Tories. In 1747, a triumphant Henry Pelham moved quickly to extract Britain from the war. Footnote. In this election, the Tories, quote, held a majority of the English shires where representation was most real, end quote. At Aix-la-Chapelle, negotiations led to an offering of territorial gains. Britain did not gain territory, but obliged France to expel the pretender and once again recognize the Hanoverian succession. Spain renewed its grant of the Asiento to Britain until 1750. A bloody, destructive, and expensive war, the, quote, futile and unintelligible, end quote, war of Austrian succession, 1740-8, to eight, ended with very little having changed or having been gained by any side. Peace negotiations were followed by Pelham's subsequent efforts to reduce the burden of the nation's debt. In two short years, he reduced Britain's armed forces from 50,000 to fewer than 19,000 in the army, and from 51,000 to 10,000 in the navy. Horace Walpole commented, quote, You will hear little news from England, but of robberies, the numbers of disbanded soldiers and sailors have all taken to the road, or rather to the street. People are almost afraid of stirring after it is dark. End quote. Quoted in, as quoted in Leadham. Pelham reduced the interest rate, consolidating the national debt, and lowered the government expenditure from £12 million to £7 million per annum. The land tax was reduced from four shillings on the pound to two. These efforts freed up capital for heavier investment in agriculture, just in time for the era of high parliamentary enclosures. Conclusion.
At the outset of the 18th century in England, the refound unity of the ruling landed elite appeared to be in jeopardy once more as the Tories enjoyed a rival of revival of power during Anne's reign, and inter-party disputes sharpened over issues of popular sovereignty, the divine right of kings, and the threat of a Jacobite rising, possibly accompanied by a French invasion in support of the, a Stuart restoration. Yet in spite of fighting two wars with France over the span of 26 years, from 1688 to 1714, interrupted by only four years of peace, 1697 to 1701, and an agrarian depression lasting throughout most of the period, exports surged ahead and England managed to position itself as Europe's primary entrepot state, as well as an the leading exporter, as well as the leading exporter of cheap grain. <laughs> the favorable the favorable balance of trade was essential. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Where am I? Jesus Christ. To enabling England to maintain a permanent deployment of the army and a near permanent deployment of the navy. The quote, double forward commitment, end quote, as well as providing unprecedented military subsidies to its allies. While a positive trade balance with Europe, an upswing in colonial trade, and the financial reforms of William III were all necessary factors in explaining how England was able to hold its own in the battlefield against France, a country three times its size, the expansion of trade and empire were themselves largely made possible by the growth of agrarian productivity and the expansion of the domestic market. The effective annexation of Scotland in 1707 broadened this domestic market and made Great Britain the largest free trade area in the world. Many lines of production enjoyed protective legislation to foster their continued expansion. The building of stately country houses also gained momentum as larger landowners increasingly consolidated their holdings, with similar landlords finding it increasingly difficult to keep up with the game even as merchants and other urban, quote, bourgeois and, quote, men of wealth sought to buy their way into the gentry by purchasing estates. Between the Whig electoral victory in the violent elections of 1714, the passing of Queen Anne and the defeat of the old pretender, <laughs> in the following year, the Whiggish forces of limited popular sovereignty effectively buried their Tory opponents, who had long sought to uphold the divine right of the Stuart kings to reclaim the throne they had lost in 1688-9. As in those years, ruling class unity and hegemony was once again restored. In the, in the decades to come, Whig hegemony would mean stability with corruption, continued expansion of foreign trade, a deepening of empire, and the rise of a great landed house to new heights of opulence as enclosures, improved farming and land consolidation, and agrarian capitalist tenant farming continued to spread. Parliament, acting as the body representing the landed classes, once again secure in their refound unity and hegemony, set about a process of, quote, enclosing, end quote, agrarian property rights in a battery of harsh, new, and punitive laws in, which what, in what came to be known as the Bloody Code. <laughs> Under the leadership of Robert Walpole, Britain's first prime minister, the landed elite would also now begin to wean the state off the land tax and shift the burden of taxation away from the landlord class and on to the working poor. The relative ease with which the economy recovered from the double from the bubble of 1720 testifies to the underlying buoyancy of the expanding agrarian capitalist economy. Most remarkably, during the so-called agrarian depression of 1730-1750, rents rose even as prices fell after reaching their lowest point in 1743, when prices stood at 92% of their 1700 equivalent. <laughs> Grain prices began rising again, and the British economy partook in the burst of post-war growth in trade that took place across Western Europe from 1748 to 1752. Since this recovery was not unique to Britain, we can list this as, in part, an exogenous factor coming to the co economy's rescue. Population growth likely compounded the effect of the recovery of foreign trade and stimulating prices. It was precisely in 1751, the same year that the heir to the throne died suddenly of pleurisy, 
the excuse me. It's precisely in 1751, the same year that the heir to the throne died suddenly of pleurisy, when the first in a series of bad harvest hit, further stimulating prices but putting the squeeze on real wages. Footnote. At the time of his death, on the 20th of March 1751, Prince Frederick was in the midst of laying plans for his succession, which he intended to usher in a new era of free, a new era free of corruption. Frederick's son, George XII, suddenly became the subject of intrigues and a struggle over who should act as regent upon the death of George II. Excuse me. That's disgusting, but the fall is my allergy season. Large exports of grain continued until 1755, after which they steadily declined. The trend of low prices for primary products and grain exports went into reverse. Rising prices caused domestic consumption to falter, and it appears that this meant more goods were available to fuel the export boom. In from 1756, excuse me, 1756 to 7 brought the worst harvest of those years. And the series of bad harvests that had begun in 1751 lasted until 1758 and ensured that agrarian prices stayed high. With the cost of bread and the demand for labor rising simultaneously, wages rose in turn. According to A.H. John, it was only when the cost of labor increased that machinery such as the fly shuttle, the gig mill, and the warping mill were adopting more, adopted more widely. Quote, it was when cost and prices altered in a drastic way during the late 50s and 60s that the way was open for more radical changes, end quote. For John, quote, the unique importance of the years 1680 to 1750 lies in the emergence, for the first time, of a situation in which the terms of trade between manufacturers and primary products turned in favor of the former for reasons other than a fall in population. Until then, the major variable had been the size of population, and relative changes in these two categories of production followed as a consequence." End quote. John. John cites... Numerous factors to explain how this change in the terms of trade came about, including a redeployment of resources, with capital chasing cheaper labor in the North and West, the process of achieving national financial unification, and the addition of skilled labor to the economy through the expansion of industry into new regions. However, John concludes that, quote, a large measure of the credit, end quote, for the fact that by 1750, Great Britain was the largest free trade zone in the world, quote, must go to agricultural improvement, which coincided with a long period of slowly growing population, end quote. Footnote. John was perhaps the first to systematically examine the linkages between the dramatic development in agriculture and the growth of manufacturing in the decades anticipating the onset of the Industrial Revolution. By placing a heavy emphasis on prices and demographics, however, John's economic approach leaves the impression of a merely incidental relationship between productivity, falling prices, and changing terms of trade for manufacturing and, shop and stops short of identifying the specifically capitalist dynamic driving agrarian change. End footnote. If it was possible for agriculture to respond to falling prices with intensified production and improved, product pr improved productivity, what then could be achieved in manufacturing? End of chapter three.